Good, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm calling the regular meeting of the Planning Commission to order for Thursday, February 14th, 2019, and happy Valentine's Day, everybody. So, <laughs> Ms. Vaughn, would you call roll, please? Thank you. Chair Wiscombe? Here. Vice Chair Jordan? Here. Commissioner Campanella? Here. Commissioner Lodge? Here. Commissioner Schwartz? Here. Commissioner Thompson? Here. Commissioner Higgins is absent. Thank you, Ms. Vaughn. Um, going to move on to um, item number two, preliminary matters. Two, two pre preliminary matters. Two A is request for continuances, withdrawals, postponements, or addition of X agenda items. Mr. Busk. Chair Wiscombe, we have none. Okay, thank you. And how about B announcements and appeals? I just wanted to announce that the appeal of 35 North Calle Cesar Chavez has been um, will be heard by the City Council on March 5th, and Chair Wiscombe will be representing the Planning Commission on that item. Great, unless someone else would would be would love to step forward on that. <laughs> no, I'm happy to do it. Thank you. Madam Chair, I just wanted yes. to disclose that I will be in attendance, although I, as you know, you and I have chatted, I, I don't intend to speak, but I'll be there supporting uh, our chair and the Planning Commission's decision on that item. Thank you. Great, okay, thank you very much, Commissioner Schwartz. Okay, uh, item number C, review, consideration, and action on the following draft Planning Commission minutes and resolutions. We have uh, the minutes, uh, draft minutes from the January 17th, 2019 meeting, and we have PC resolution number 003-19 for 726 North Lacumbre Road. Uh, would anyone like those taken separately? Okay, are there Move any? Move to approve the minutes and the resolution. Okay. Second. Okay. We have a motion by uh, Commissioner Thompson, second by Commissioner Jordan. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Abstain. I was not at the meeting. And I'm also abstaining since I, oops, sorry, I missed part of the meeting. Okay, so that, that's right. You had to leave before we actually voted on it. Yes, okay. So we have two abstentions from, um, <clears throat> excuse me, Commissioner Campanella and Commissioner Lodge, and uh, the motion carries the rest of us were unanimous or were in favor of it okay now we're moving on to item 2d comments from members of the public pertaining to items not on this agenda does is anyone here wishing to speak to the commission on anything not on the agenda okay seeing that i'm going to close general public comment and we're moving on to item number three which is uh, a discussion item which is staff's update of the state's 2017 housing legislation package um, which uh, basically uh, the items that will be highlighted are AB Assembly Bill 678, Senate Bill 167, Senate Bill 35, and Senate Bill 166. And uh, we have Ms. Ms. Osteringer, are you doing the presentation? Yes, uh, Great. Chair Wiscombe. Welcome. And Ms. Dicey's here also for? Yes. Okay, for any questions. Great, okay. Welcome to both of you. Thank you very much. Uh, well, while we're getting set up for that, um, I'll just make a announcement. I know that the presentation is divided into basically three parts to discuss these bills. So um, Commissioner Campanella had a very good idea that um, we go through the presentation and if there's any public comment, we can hear public comment. And then after we take public comment, we close public comment, it'll be back to the commission and we'll discuss each of these separately. So if you have questions, we'll take them one by one in the order that they were given in the presentation and ask questions. I think that will that will make it simpler than, than skipping around. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you, Chair Wiscombe. Uh, I wanna first uh, caveat my presentation. I'm sick, so I was taking some serious cold medication to get me through this and my mouth is very dry, so I'll probably be taking uh, drinks of water during the presentation so that to release my tongue from the top of my you're, mouth. You're allowed to do thank that. You. Yeah. <laughs> we won't hold that against you. <laughs> And I wanted to thank uh, Ms. Deisty. She did um, a lot of the work on the PowerPoint presentation that you're going to be seeing, and I really appreciate uh, the good job that she did. 
Also, she's done a lot of boots on the ground uh, research with regards to what other cities are doing with respect to the 2017 housing legislation. And I think um, what she can offer is invaluable, and, it, and especially as we go through the process. So what I wanna talk to you about is the 2017 housing le legislation, how it affects the city, um, and where we're going with that. So as you may know, in 2017, uh, Governor Brown approved a housing package consisting of 15 bills. They uh, were essentially designed to strip local control um, from city's housing regulations uh, in order to promote affordability, uh, streamline projects, and make them uh, more affordable for developers. There's, I wanted to call your attention to this link down here um, and the Publix. This is um, from the H Housing and Community Development website. It is an informative, um, detailed summary of the 2017 housing package. If you scroll down, it's, here's the summary of, the, of all the bills. And they say that there's 15. I've only found 14. I know there's got to be a 15 somewhere, but I only counted 14. Uh, so I just wanted to make you aware of that. You'll also find um, the guidelines for SB 35 that we'll talk about later. And for reference, the information contained uh, on that website fits into this binder. So that's how much information uh, is contained on that website. So there's 15 uh, bills, but we're only gonna talk about three. And I've selected these three because I think they're the most critical to address um, the, right now for our city and other cities. And it's the Housing Accountability Act, the Streamline Ministerial Appro Approval Process, um, which is more commonly known as SB 35, and then the no net loss housing. I've kind of thrown in a fourth bill, AB 72, at the end because I wanted to talk about uh, the state's enforcement uh, of these bills and how it affects us. So the Housing Accountability Act is not new. It's been around since 1982. Uh, it was the legislature's attempt to address at what that time they said was a critical problem that threatens the economic environment and social quality of life in California, basically a critical housing problem that they saw in 1982 that according to the legislature was partially caused by activities and policies of many local governments. We fast forward 30 years, 30 years plus now, and that is, since we haven't really approached our housing needs in California, this is why the legislature adopted um, the amendments in 2017 to the Housing Accountability Act. They've declared um, in the legislation that California has basically gone from critical to crisis with regards to housing and affordability. And I don't usually like to put a lot of scripts in my slides, but I thought this one was really powerful. Uh, to show what the legislature is thinking and why they're taking away um, local control. If you read the language there, according to the legislature, <clears throat> the housing crisis is robbing future generations of the chance to call California their home, stifling economic opportunities, worsening poverty and homelessness, and undermining the state's environmental uh, climate objectives. And The California data has shown that we have a uh, 2 million unmet housing need, so we need 2 million units. Uh, and annually, up to 2025, we need to be producing 180,000 units to meet uh, housing needs. So the purpose of um, Housing Accountability Act and the amendments is basically to curb the capability of local governments to deny and reduce density or render projects infeasible because of density. This is taken exactly from the statute. And by doing that, they intend to increase uh, housing construction.
the Housing Accountability Act applies to nearly all multi-unit housing uh, for residents only projects, transitional and supportive housing, and then also for mixed youth with at least two thirds residential uh, floor area. A project, if it complies with objective general planning and zoning subdivision standards and including design review standards um, cannot be denied or reduced in density, at least not for density reasons. So let's talk about what's objective. Um, thankfully, the statute has provided a definition and it's a, a fairly good one. It says standards that involve no personal or subjective judgment by a public official and are uniformly verifiable by reference to an in external and uniform benchmark or criterion available and knowable by both the development applicant and the public official prior to submittal. So basically it's creating a check the box for zoning and design standards. So I said that a project cannot be reduced in density or denied based on density, but there is an unless. Um, the city can deny a project or reduce density if it makes the following findings supported by a preponderance of the evidence that the development would have a specific adverse impact on public health and safety unless it was denied or reduced in density. And there's no feasible method that exists to mitigate or avoid the adverse impact. And I wanted to talk about um, the word preponderance of the evidence. This was a change that occurred in legislation in 2018. The legislature changed the standard of review from substantial evidence to preponderance of the evidence. And this has a particular legal significance um, if a project's challenged in court. Uh, under substantial evidence, the court has gives the city more deference in its decisions. So under substantial evidence, as long as there's evidence that would support the city's decision, even if there was a decision evidence that could support it going another way, the uh, judge would support and find in favor of the city. However, under the preponderance of the evidence standard, uh, there has to be more evidence than not that supports the city's decision or the judge will find in favor of the plaintiff. I also wanted to address um, the lack of the word welfare. Um, generally with um, cities, our police power extends to health, safety, and welfare. This is particularly uh, notable that it's lacking because welfare goes more to the benefits that a community receives. Um, it addresses livability in community, whereas health and safety is clearly defined. <clears throat> and um, we can talk about that. Uh, what is the specific adverse impact? And that's a significant, quantifiable, direct, and unavoidable impact based on objective, identified, written, public health or safety standards, policies, or conditions as they existed on the date the application was deemed complete. So um, I wanted to point out too that another change that occurred in 2018, um, not part of this housing uh, package, was a statement that went into the code section that basically said the legislature finds that there's highly unlikely that there would be any uh, adverse public health or safety impacts. So that's something um, when the court reviews a, the statute, if it was ever a uh, case brought before them, they would look at that and that would be weighed in consideration of um, health and safety standards. And though I was thinking about it and trying to, to s figure out what would be a health or safety standard, and I can imagine, I suppose, if a project had significant impacts um, based on its mass um, from traffic impacts or public safety. That's what occurred to me. I also wanted to address um, the last word deemed complete when the application is deemed complete. So uh, I could foresee that the project is deemed complete and then from completion to approval that circumstances may change and we're stuck that would perhaps cause um, a health and safety impact. 
that we weren't able to foresee or address. So I'm not saying we couldn't go back. There's other probably legal remedies we could take, but the point that the statute is trying to make is that you can't look backwards um, and decide later that we want to make a change and use that as a way to, to reduce a project's density. So what constitutes a, a reduction in density? The, the statute defines lower density that includes any condition that would have the same effect or impact on the ability to provide housing. I think the obvious is um, a reduction in the, the footprint, a uh, reduction in a, a floor level, um, arguably possibly bedrooms, because um, I could foresee that if a, you had a three bedroom and to reduce density you went to two, you, and size, bulk, and scale, you're not in, you're not supplying the same amount of housing that you could be. But that really hasn't been, I haven't seen any cities get challenged on that. There are limitations uh, under the Housing Accountability Act. CEQA still applies, projects have to comply. And uh, if the project is within the coastal zone, the Coastal Act's subjective criteria must still be met. So moving to the amendments um, from the 2017 package that became effective on January 1st of 2018, uh, one of the things we saw was a tightening of the definition of objective standards. Uh, a project uh, will be found consistent with objective standards if a substantial evidence allows a reasonable person to conclude its compliance. So looking to, I think the key there is the reasonable person. And then they tightened up the application processing requirements and a project must be deemed um, consistent or inconsistent within 30 to 60 days, um, depending on the number of units. If the project's um, deemed inconsistent with the city's ob uh, objective zoning or design standards, we have to specifically state in writing how and where it's not meeting those design standards. So for projects that are 150 or less, we have 30 days to review for consistency, and projects above 150, we have 60 days. If we can't meet this timeline, the project is deemed uh, legally consistent. I think one of the most important uh, changes that came through the legislation was the, the power and authority that the legislature conveyed on the courts. Uh, the city, if it denies a project and is challenged in court and loses, has only 60 days to re-review the project um, for compatibility. And uh, it also is, has to pay the plaintiff's attorney fees, which if you know, the attorney's fees is worse than a lot of times than any penalty or damages that could be assessed against the city. If we fail to comply within 60 days and review the project, then we have the potential to be fined a minimum of $10,000 per unit and if the, the court finds that we acted in bad faith in uh, not complying with our 60 days or reviewing the project, they can order fines multiple by a factor of fine five, so $50,000 per unit. Also, what's really unique is if the city doesn't act in 60 days, the court can directly approve the project and um, skirt our authority. This is really unusual. Um, generally in these type of proceedings, the judges tell the city, you did, a, you did something wrong, you have to go back and do it again, but I'm not gonna tell you what the answer is. In this case, they're basically saying, I'm telling you what the answer is and taking away your authority. Uh, I don't know um, if many judges would go this route since it is so highly unlikely. I think they'd be more comfortable with the $50,000 per unit fine, but, but it is a, an available remedy. So I wanted to talk to you and give you an example that Ms. Deisty found. Um, it's coming out of the city of Berkeley. 
It was a um, single unit um, that was proposed to be demolished uh, and replaced with three uh, detached two-story homes. It was approved by Berkeley Zoning Board, uh, but the neighbors appealed generally on a neighborhood compatibility uh, finding. It went to the city council. The city council uh, granted the appeal and denied the project, making, among other findings, the um, neighborhood compatibility findings. So the uh, project proponent uh, appealed to the court, and the court found that they had not made the necessary findings, that it was a specific adverse impact on health and safety or um, its consistency analysis. So it sent it back to the city, and uh, the city reviewed it again and denied the project again, but apparently didn't learn its lesson and still didn't make the necessary findings. So the judge um, sent it back for another review. It was eventually approved, but the city was required to pay um, attorney's fees up to $44,000. All right, so the Housing Accountability Act is all about in, um, encouraging growth um, and density. Um, but the Housing Streamlining Act, uh, Senate Bill 35, introduced by Senator Weiner, is about speed. It's about um, streamlining the approval process that certain qualified projects uh, have uh, and getting them through the process in 180 days. Uh, it applies to jurisdictions that have not met their RENA numbers. Uh, as of June of 2018, 337 jurisdictions had not met their numbers and only 14 had. So the city of Santa Barbara is uh, not among the 14. So we are subject to SB 35. And I wanted to give you uh, just an update on where we are. Uh, this is through 2017. We're working on our 2018 numbers, which I believe are due in April, due in April to the state. Um, we are in an eight year um, housing element planning process. So it's from 2014 to 2022. Uh, and 2020, we'll start uh, relooking at allocation ag again. So, Eligible projects, um, it's, uh, Mr. Vincent uh, often referred to these as the unicorn projects, but I, uh, I don't share his uh, forward thinking that these are so unicornish. Um, <laughs> they uh, are multi-unit infill um, projects, rental or for sale, um, at least two units. Um, mixed use, as long as it has at least two thirds uh, residential floor area. Uh, the projects, if they have uh, 10 units or greater, are subject to affordability covenants. So for um, it's 10 percent of the units have to be affordable to uh, households um, less than 80 percent of the area medium income. And the affordability covenants for rentals is 55 years and for um, for sale homes it's 45 years. The projects also require, require prevailing wage. Um, and I think this is what's going to make it um, a little less palatable for developers. It's a higher wage rate. It's what um, public agencies are required to pay on public projects. So I think that coupled with the affordability and um, the prevailing wage makes them a little less exciting. Um, but the big thing is they have to be consistent with our objective zoning and subdivision and design review standards. And uh, I think that's the big part. If we don't have objective standards, we don't have anything. <laughs> the projects are required to be reviewed for consistency to the objective standards um, within 60 and 90 days. So. 60 days for projects 150 or less, 90 uh, for over 150. 
uh, we are allowed to do design review at the same time uh, that we're uh, analyzing for consistency. And as long as our um, re design reviews are objective standards that don't, and they use the words chill, uh, the approval process that needs to be completed in 90 days for 150 units and 180 days uh, for greater than 150, uh, we can do that design review. So there's some locational exclusions on where these projects can occur. Um, they cannot occur in the coastal zone, wetlands, protected species habitats, conservation lands, hazard waste sites, which seems obvious, and uh, mobile home RV parks. They also cannot require the demolition of housing subject to rent control uh, or housing occupied by tenants within the past 10 years or a historic structure um, on the national or uh, state or local register. So we've created a, a map of where we think they could occur, and I know it's hard to read, um, but the white is basically the areas that we've looked at where we think uh, they would meet the criteria uh, for allowable SB 35. Uh, here's a snapshot. Obviously, we don't have the rental tenant data, so that I think it would it would probably significantly shrink the area in white, especially since these are infill projects, and I think in a lot of the infill areas, we're already seeing uh, rental housing there. The, um, there's also less stringent parking requirements for these projects. Um, it's one space per dwelling unit, unless uh, the project is located within a half a mile of public transit, um, or within a historical district, um, one block of car share, uh, and in areas where street parking permits are required but not offered to the project occupants. Uh, so we do have car share in the city. Um, it's on a very limited basis, but it's out there. And then also the, within one half mile of public transit, that's a, a rail station or a, a bus stop with two or more routes that uh, has uh, a bus coming uh, every 15 minutes or less during peak commuter uh, hours. So uh, there's a lot of locations, I think, that we could see projects with no parking. So we were talking about design guidelines and objective standards. Um, Excuse me, I'm sorry, Madam yes. Chair. I, my presentation only goes to a page nine um, also, Mr. Jordan is commenting the same, so I'm not sure if our packet got truncated in terms of uh, Ms. Ostranger's PowerPoint, but we don't seem to have the full PowerPoint. I have the same error on my copy, so I'm asking it to get reprinted. Okay, excellent. Thank you. If you could slow us down a bit, Ms. Ostranger, because we're eager to follow you on uh, each slide. <laughs> on okay. Or I don't know if we want to just... Okay, thank you. Are, that's, uh, we can't correct that during this meeting, can we, Ms. Vaughn? Uh, it's not posted online anywhere, it's just okay. your presentation. Okay, yeah, I, I printed out my own copy, so. <laughs> okay, maybe just as a follow-on, if staff could forward that to the commission and post it online so all of us have your full PowerPoint, that would be very helpful, sure. thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, so, um, Ms. Deisty did some good research and um, cities that have um, implemented some objective design criteria. I don't know how many uh, she found. I, I know she found Fremont, so I don't think there's very many. Fremont was ahead of the game. They adopted theirs in March of 2018. But you can see that it, it's definitely a criteria that you can look at on its face and design around, uh, as opposed to what's on the left, um, which is our current ABR design guidelines, um, which are definitely more subjective because they just don't have particular numbers. Um, and then there's, the courts have all already said uh, objective standards, um, sensitivity to neighborhood is generally not one of those. So that could be a problem. We can also do, if we're um, looking at redoing our design guidelines, we can talk about roof pitch, tile color, 
and it doesn't have to be a, a one size fits all for the city. We can look at them in different areas and design to specific districts. I wanted to give you uh, an example of an SB 35 project and one in particular that didn't have objective uh, design standards and this is the Valco Town Center that um, is in Cupertino. It was a project that was several years in the making and uh, before SB 35 and the, the developer had offered uh, quite a bit of community benefit through the original development. But when uh, SB 35 came around, the developer decided that and they would take advantage of the new legislation and uh, put the project through. Uh, the city, since it at that time didn't have any design uh, criteria, <laughs> didn't have much say in, in what was proposed. Uh, they had to find it um, consistent within 90 days, which they did. And the project was uh, eventually approved in 180 days. I was hoping that I could get up the there's a really nice um, handout from Cupertino that shows, it's not gonna come up, the density. Oh, yeah, thank you. So just to give you an idea, um, the housing units didn't change too much. In fact, it, it went down from uh, 2,900 proposed to about 2,400. But really where you're seeing um, the lack of design standards is the original project uh, ranged from about 45 feet or three stories uh, with a, a max of 13 stories. Um, and then, but the new project uh, was up to 240 feet with 22 stories. It uh, originally proposed a six acre park uh, with 60% landscape. Now it was a 22 acre rooftop park with four acres at ground level. Um, none of the community benefits that had uh, been proposed with the exception of affordability units. So it, it, this part project actually has 50% affordability, um, which is the pretty much the only com uh, community benefit that they got out of this project. Um, the website, when you get your handout, the, um, the, the website's shown here. If you click on that button or paste that in, you'll, you'll find it. So I wanted to talk about no net loss housing because I think it's the driver behind um, SB 35 and the Housing Accountability Act. Um, those are how we get housing and, and this is what's forcing us to get the housing. Uh, as you know, uh, no net loss housing is about um, maintaining and meeting our, our arena numbers. <laughs> Uh, the city must ensure that its housing element and inventory can accommodate um, at all times uh, its re remaining unmet arena numbers. We can't take any action that's going to reduce particularly our, our lower and moderate income households. I kind of see the best way for me as I think about this is it's kind of robbing Peter to pay Paul. If you're going to have a lower density project, um, you've got to put it somewhere else and make it to meet your arena numbers. Um, kind of like a little bit of a shell game. Uh, this is just since the no net loss housing focuses a lot on um, complying by income level. This is from our housing element uh, and it shows our percentage and, and what, what we're required to meet uh, and accommodate for. So uh, no net loss housing isn't new. Um, and it's generally, per, um, even before the 2017 package, it just provides that um, the cities cannot reduce residential density of a parcel um, or approve a project at less than its assigned density unless um, the action is consistent with our general plan and housing elements and that the remaining sites inside our housing elements are adequate to meet ARENA at every income level. What is new um, in the 2017 package is that when we make these findings, um, which have to be based on substantial evidence, we also now have to put in writing a, um, a quantitative analysis indicating all of our unmet housing uh, needs at every income level and identify in our 
housing element where we're going to meet those what sites uh, for every housing uh, level income level excuse me so there's I apologize there's um, a typo in this anytime you see the word density it's supposed to be unit um, this this is brand new this whole section is brand new from the 2017 um, and it this provides that we not only can we not reduce density we now can't reduce uh, housing units on a parcel or approve um, less units than assigned under our uh, housing element unless we find that it's consistent with our general plan um, and housing elements and that we have adequate uh, sites uh, identified to meet RENA and then we have the same uh, finding that needs to be made with regards to um, quantifying unmet with where we're going to meet them in the housing element. Ms. Ostringer, can you just uh, stop for one sec and have a sip of water Thank and you. just let um, the commissioners catch up to? I'm on page, or I'm on slide 38. Slide 38, okay. Thank you. Ms. Vaughn, thank you very much for doing that. So this is also new. Um, if the city approves a project at less um, than its designated unit density, uh, and it, it needs to it cannot meet, um, find in its housing element a alternate site to meet its RENA needs, it must, after uh, approving the project, uh, find an alternate site within 180 days. Uh, and so that it can meet its arena needs at that income level. The, there's also language in there that says that we cannot disapprove a project just because uh, we can't identify um, within our housing element a way to meet our arena needs. I think uh, it, it's not stated in the legislation, but I think this comes off of SB 35 so that we can't uh, we can't deny a project just because it comes in with numbers that um, affordability numbers that aren't meeting our uh, income levels and it's forcing us to then identify uh, other things that would be an, a, this would be an example of an objective standard in our housing element that a project wouldn't comply with so this is specifically saying we can't we can't deny uh, on density based on on this So SB 72 uh, was enacted to basically give teeth to the new legislation. It's, I kind of call it the, I call it the watchdog provision. That's not what anyone else calls it, but I like it. Uh, and it amended um, 65.585 and uh, provides that the um, HCD now shall review any action or failure to act by the city that it determines is inconsistent with the housing element. And I think it's uh, important to note the word shall because that's the legislature's intent on um, creating an obligation on behalf of the um, HCD. They can't look away. It's now something that they have to take into account. And if they, when they're looking, if they find something inconsistent, they need to, to make the written findings on um, how the city or, or county is not complying uh, as inconsistent with its housing element. And it, cities have 30 days to respond, either correct uh, or respond in how they, they believe they're being consistent with their housing element. Um, if they don't, the findings stand and you, you can't rely on your, your housing element. Basically, you're looking at a decertification. The, the new bill also gave um, the HCD the tool through the Attorney General to bring um, civil actions if it finds that cities are inconsistent with their, their housing elements or there's violations of the Housing Accountability Act, the No Net Loss Housing Law, the State Density Bonus Law, um, or the Housing Anti-Discrimination Law. And I think if, if you've been following the news, which I think most of you have, we all have heard about Huntington Beach, and Ms. Deisty's um, been following it a little more closely than, than I have, so she may be able to answer questions if you have 
at questions about uh, Huntington Beach. So with now that we know about SB 35 and the Housing Accountability Act and uh, our need for objective uh, zoning and design standards, uh, where do we go from here? Well, we've already starting at staff level to, to address this. Uh, and I think you know because we've been uh, before you to ask you to, to join and give us two members for an ad hoc subcommittee that's going to uh, work with staff to design some objective standards for multi-unit housing and hopefully conduct a little public outreach. We've also now have appointed two members, each from HLC and ABR, who will be joining the subcommittee. Um, I think one of the most important things is the public outreach. Uh, with, in Santa Barbara, I th we've had a long history of creating and designing projects through de design rev review that we know or feel are compatible with um, our special community. And so just educating the public on the fact that this isn't necessarily voluntary on the part of the city, that we're responding to state legislation and, and a loss of control at, um, at the local level. And uh, we are having to meet our needs, but that we're gonna do it um, as carefully and as um, creatively as possible to make sure that we're getting objective design standards that, that truly protect what is Santa Barbara, but also allow us to meet our state mandated housing, housing needs. These are our milestones. Um, obviously, it's very aggressive uh, since we already are going to have the ordinance uh, adopted as of winter of 2019, so I apologize, typo there. We're, we want to get this done in a year. Uh, I think it's important. Um, it's going to be a, a really concerted work effort. And Rosie, how many often are we planning on meeting with the subcommittees? Um, about every two weeks. Okay, so yeah, so we're planning on meeting uh, about every two weeks for three months with the subcommittees. So it's, it's gonna be a lot of effort on behalf of both staff and um, our committee members. With that, questions? Thank you for the presentation, Ms. Ostringer. I think that was, that was really great. Um, okay, I think um, I see lights going on. So we're gonna, um, I don't know if Commissioner Higgins was here, but when we started, but we're gonna start, we're gonna go one bill at a time. So you can ask questions and make comments. So if your questions are on SB 35, we're not there yet. We're at Housing Accountability um, Act first. Yeah. Um, yeah, do we have any slips for public comment? I didn't see any. Okay, seeing no one public comments close then. Um, okay, so we'll start with, um, is that why your light was on? Oh, okay, okay. So let's start with the um, Housing Accountability Act, um, Assembly Bill 678 and Senate Bill 167, and uh, questions and or comments on that. Um, Commissioner Jordan, your light's on. I'm transposing old to new. So stop me if I go too far. All right, I'm just kind of working my way through. So the um, the slide that I can't read, but it's called Specific Adverse Impact Defined that talks about deemed complete. We've actually, of Can course. You, could you tell uh, for our benefit which slide number that is? I have no is? idea. I can't read it. Oh. It's on page four slide of your follow. handout at the bottom. Someone. I think it's slide 12. I believe it's slide 12. It's a driving test. Yeah, specific adverse impact defined. Yeah. Yeah, slide yeah it's slide 12. Okay. It's really just the phrase. I don't think the slide is important, but. Are we, are we locked up? You do. I'm pretty much guilty. So the, just the phrase deemed complete causes all kinds of mischief, seems like. We've had um, a couple of years worth of uh, discussion on that with uh, AUDs. And I'm just wondering, when that says deemed complete, is it our deemed complete? Is it their deemed complete? 
do we get to move the timeline left and right on accomplishment or period of time as to what we deem complete, or how does that get applied exactly? And Ms. Dicey, you can stop me. Is it, it deemed complete is the the projects uh, basically done, <laughs> and it's not approved, but it's. This doesn't, this doesn't help It's complete. Me. There's nothing else to add to right. it. So we've had discussions in the past where opinions have been offered that deemed complete is once, you've, once you have submitted everything and the packet is ready to go. We've had opinions offered that it's after your first set of approvals, and we've had discussions that it's when your permit's pulled. And all, and all three of those options are at drastically different times in a timeline or what what goes forward so I'm just I'm just wondering if you're if you're applying that word how you're applying that to different different situations so I, I think with regards to the Housing Accountability Act and SB 35 because we're supposed to have objective standards okay. which basically comes down to a checklist of what we're looking for okay. and that's really what the ministerial process is for is we look at the project and even from a staff standpoint we check off the box it's it's got this it's got that uh, and then when you take that and couple it with the fact that um, under SB 35 they've got we've got 60 and 90 days to to look for consistency I think that is kind of the completeness analysis okay. but then we have the additional time to actually approve the project and will that be fleshed out further in that timeline slide kind of thing or is this just not an issue that I'm remembering you know, I think it's a it's a point well taken. Okay, All right. Um, and then the next slide, I think, uh, when when you talk about reductions, you went through a whole list of things that me either may could be applied or couldn't, but you didn't mention size of rooms. So if somebody initially was building a big giant building, and you said, well, even if you reduce the number of bedrooms, that might be a reduction in housing. But if the bedrooms are oversized, is a design board or an approval process going to be able to look at size of rooms and play with that? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> I, it, it's just, it's, I don't think it's really been challenged. It, I, I'm, I'm not sure I'd want to, I want us to be the first, but it may be something we could look at. Okay. And then um, I think my last question in this section Oh, maybe two. Well, I don't really know. So I've moved ahead a couple pages. You can go up to 21. 21 starts the new. Where is that? Slide That's where I'm at. Top of page six. I'm not reading that too well. Top of page six, government code amendments 2018. I think I'm still there, right? I'm going up to housing streamlining, right? Slide 16. Okay. So the, the 30, 60 days requirement um, anecdotally and through personal experience, I can tell you that um, applications that go in could stall for any number of reasons. For example, you could put ADU instead of writing out the word accessory dwelling unit. And that entire application could be returned to you two weeks later until and have you fixed it. So you're when speaking you, hypothetically, you, of course. Yeah. <laughs> of course. But um, how, how does that come into play on a timeline when either that type of processing, gamesmanship, um, different opinions that are being applied to what constitutes what should be in that packet are trying to be applied against the timeline requirements? Is it, does it then uh, go back again to this checklist that's really clear that you'll check off this checklist and if that checklist didn't have, in my example, s write out accessory dwelling unit and didn't address that and you happen to put ADU, then that's not part of the requirements of that submission and you're in that timeline to be looked at? Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, there's probably a whole bunch of things like that that I don't even know about. Allison's nodding. I know. I know she knows about all these, but but uh, it just seems to me that um, that the 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 timeline is really specific, and the the penalties are really specific, but they don't really address what it's supposed to look like when it gets in there. And is that really just a check boxes? And if you meet the check boxes, you're done. 
I think that's what it's generally intended to be, okay. yes. That'll be part of this process as you flush it out too then, right? Yes. Okay. Then last question on the next slide, the, um, you referenced um, um, some actions that had actually led through lawsuits. And I'm going to jump ahead. I'm sorry. There was a slide near the end talking about um, enforcement. H, somebody's um, uh, enforcement back to the city. So is, is the only recourse through any one of these a lawsuit or does a applicant have both the recourse of a lawsuit or talking to HCD and saying the city isn't playing correctly and asking the HCD to initiate a process against the city? I think if HCD was to be involved, the applicant would be going to them okay. with a, a, a consistent uh, pattern or practice of not complying. Is, um, so that is an avenue. So an applicant wouldn't necessarily have to hire an attorney, go to court, wait a year or two on their project to, to get an answer. If they, if they were seeing things that didn't qualify, they, would also, they, would, they could be an initiator to HCD. I don't understand. Uh, the way I read the uh, AB 72 is it's the attorney general is only going to get involved to address a, a pervasive problem like a an inconsistency, but it's not a project by project. Um, they coming so the, in and saying, "Oh well, I'll fix this for you." It's even a, the no even the slide before that attorney general one, where you talk about that somebody does somehow some complaint gets made, they notify you. You have 30 days to reply. That's not a applicant initiated process. That's initiated at the HCD level. Okay. So yeah. it's them looking down at us. Yes, through that that watchdog um, obligation that they now okay. have. All right. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Jordan. Okay, we're still on the Housing Accountability Act. Uh, Commissioner Schwartz. Um, thank you. I didn't want to truncate anybody. Was anybody before me or no? I'm ready. Okay. Uh, and um, I hope I'm not. You'll tell me if I'm moving ahead uh, beyond where we want to go now. So. Uh, first to slide 11, uh, which starts out unless, that's the title, unless. City makes the following findings supported by preponderance of the evidence. Uh, the term public health and safety, I think we've asked about this in prior hearings, but now I think with, with your presentation, I'm interested, um, if not today, for you to provide us some references, Ms. Ostringer, as to exactly how we're going to legally define public health and safety. There's been some discussion about that. Uh, or So will that be, to my question, will that be taken up by our subcommittee work on the residential multi-unit objective de design standards, or is there something in place now from the city attorney's office that can just be distributed that perhaps comes from state law, building code, I'm not sure what. You, you know, I, I can't see you. Uh, I would hesitate to make a, a, a definitive outline of what that is because I, I feel like that would tie the city's hands um, as a project by project basis, um, especially if there was something that was outside of those guidelines that we hadn't anticipated that we, we clearly, once we saw it, knew was a health and safety impact, I would hate to take that to court and have the judge say that's not on your list. Uh, do we have any guidance from state law or um, I'll look HCD, there. anything like that relative to the new law that could help us at least create some goalposts for ourselves as we move forward with subcommittee work? And you know, Commissioner Campanella and I are on the Planning Commission subcommittee for this upcoming work. S so I know that there's case law um, with regards to nuisance activity that where um, cities are bringing code enforcement cases because of nuisance uh, with relation to public health and safety. Mm -hmm. So that's where I, I, I know I would look. I don't know if the state's provided anything. Yeah. Is that perhaps a sort of a, um, a follow-on piece of research that I'd like to see um, staff in the city attorney's office look into. I think this is going to come up. Once we start to go down this, this path of having to be more and more concrete or to standardize our decision making, I think this is going to arise. Um, and applicants are going to ask uh, the decision making bodies for clear definitions. So I think, I think that's an inevitable 
uh, question we're going to have to answer, even with some guidelines. And I don't, I don't know how that will look going forward, but if, if I could leave that with you, I would, uh, please. Um, I want to, uh, then the next slide is slide 11, and I think it was just now Commissioner Jordan uh, talked about this term deem complete. So this is the slide entitled specific comma adverse impact defined. Slide 12, yes. Slide 12, yes, slide 12. This term deem complete is really vexing for us as decision makers and probably even more so for applicants. And this is another issue that I think um, I'm confident we are going to have to more concretely define in the city uh, if we don't want to get ourselves sideways legally going forward with the conjunction with the new state laws. I'm not sure what you might suggest be the right venue or forum for that, uh, but I don't think that conversation or a few examples, this is how we've been handling this topic of deemed complete and the question of deemed complete, I think it's going to come to the fore as we have to apply these laws and comply with them and not have a standard that every application, that applies to every application. So I don't want to get into a big discussion today. We have you know, many other slides to discuss, but I want to put this on your radar because this will return for us, I believe. Okay, then I want to ask you about slide 13, what constitutes a reduction? I noted that you mentioned three aspects of a project, footprint, floor level, bedrooms. Can you talk a little bit more about, is, is that, would that be a complete list? Um, do you see us working through perhaps a, a longer list? And then if the, you have any more detailed comments about footprint, floor, floor level is floor level, that's, you know, bedrooms, um, just number of bedrooms, was that going to be a, a, con a sufficiently concrete um, issue that would constitute lower density, or is it also size? Uh, I think this has come up with some projects that we've had recently. To appreciate any thoughts you have for me on that. So those were, those were basically just my off the top of the head. There, there's not okay. necessarily a list. Um, the definition that we're given is, is this. Um, so I think yes, right. we're, uh, whether that was uh, intended uh, to be somewhat vague, I don't know. The, in the Housing Act, Accountability Act, there is, a, I noted a difference. When they talk about a reduction in density for um, affordable projects, they're more specific um, mm -hmm. about what constitutes um, lowering density. So mm -hmm. I think that would be a starting place to to look at that at least gives guidance at what what the the state is thinking or the legislatures were thinking. And you thinking. mean affordable subsidized? We're talking about sub when you say you mean a capital A affordable subsidized? So, no, the no. Um, under the Housing Accountability Act, there's a a, a slightly different definition for uh, what happens if you lower density for a for, um, you, uh, projects that have affordability in them, and it, it lays out a different definition. This is um, the definition I provided that's a little more vague was for market rate um, okay. projects, but there is a slightly, slightly different one for mm. um, projects that contain affordability or transitional housing. Um, so that was something that we would probably look at. So just and as I don't a know why they don't. we could look to how that's defined just to give us a sense, again, kind of some guideposts or start yeah. to work on how we're going to define it because here again, this is a theme. Uh, I think as we, as, as applicants come forward and we have to apply and comply, I think we're going to really need to define in concrete ways these terms or, um, or I think we're you know, going to find ourselves in a very awkward position to say the least. So any, any way you could help us with that going forward, I would be appreciated. Uh, and then I think this is still within this section. A section, uh, slide 16, Government Code Amendments 2018. I don't, I don't have any notes here um, specifically from today, but this term inconsistent, deemed inconsistent, uh, and you mentioned kind of how and where. It's the how and it's the where of inconsistency. 
here again. Um, I don't want to press you today, but I would ask you to put this on your list. This is another term, inconsistent. What does that mean? Inconsistent with what? As you've said, the how and the where, I'd say, and with what? So to me, all of these, I don't know, all of these terms, these terms that I'm identifying are, have been part of our city's history in loosely defining, uh, subjectively defining, and, and that is, as my read, part of, that's what these laws are forcing us to move away from. So this to me is on that list of more concretely defining. And then I think my last question in this section is uh, slide 19, and this is about the city of Berkeley case. And I don't know if Ms. Deisty is best positioned to answer this. Uh, as, as this case became adjudicated and, uh, and the project resolved, project approval resolved, and the, fies, and the fines applied to the city, was there a requirement for the city of Berkeley to modify its processes and practices as a result of this lawsuit being adjudicated? I don't know if you mentioned that. I was just looking. Lawsuit filed settlement requires rehearing and compliance, but clear. It's, it would seem to me, not having read the lawsuit, that if, if the city of Berkeley's processes got them sideways legally in the first place that there would have to be modifications to the processes and practice. Do you, do you know Ms. Dice or Ms. Ostrand? I don't know for sure. Uh, I, I, I highly doubt that the court told them to modify. I think the court's jurisdiction was generally with regards to that project and I have a feeling they just said uh, go forth city and do it again. Um, so and the city didn't have, it had what it had at the time and so. I see. They, so that's what they subsequent. applied. subsequent. Maybe yeah. the city attorney of the city of Berkeley would, you know, be able to tell so did they. You know, I, I can do that research on my own. I don't, I'm not asking staff to do that. I, I would just be curious to know since this is, is this the first case that we, the only case we know of, Ms. Deisty? Um, Madam Chair and members of the commission, um, I don't know if this is the first or only case that we know of. It's just one that I found when I was doing my research. R readily. I do know this process, it was like a, a two-year process. So this started likely before the amendments were made to the Housing Accountability Act. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's possible it got amended during, while mm -hmm. this process was going on and then came to a conclusion. I don't know the exact time frame. Okay. Uh, and then I think um, if I could just ask, um, because in this section, along with other sections, uh, the term regional needs housing allocation, RENA, is referenced. And I'm not sure that there is, for educational purposes, a clear understanding by everyone, including the general public, as to exactly what that means uh, and, and uh, how we have our city, just use our city as an example, why are, how we've come to be required to comply and what's that based on. Can you give us just a, the public in general a primer, just a few sentences? Uh, and here's the reason I'm asking you for that, is that I watched both the HLC and ABR presentations by Ms. Deisty on this topic, and it seemed pretty apparent to me that some of those decision makers do not, are not educated about RENA. I'm not even sure they came away with a clear understanding of RENA, and that these are not just um, whimsical numbers that have been cast down to cities and counties. It actually comes from a foundation created by counties and cities pertaining to our zoning and our policies. So I think a primer is helpful, and if you want to just put something out uh, in writing and, and we don't get into it verbally, that's okay. But I think, um, again, now that we're entering these new legal and regulatory waters, I think that's important for everyone's understanding. I, th I think... I think that's a good point, Commissioner Schwartz. I'm thinking during you, your last slides, the, the process and the public outreach, I think that would be an excellent time mm -hmm. to, to really, you know, get the message out there about what RENA really involves and where it comes from and, you know, how we get our numbers and how, how, it's the, how the county dictates to us what they are and, and how we, um, um, you know, how they used to be a guideline and now they're, you know, they're written in stone, more to say. But I think during public outreach, I think that would be probably the, a good time. Does staff you. see that as appropriate, that folding that into yeah, uh, public I think education? Having, I think, I, 
it's definitely a good idea. That's kind of why we brought up the no net loss housing to, mm -hmm. to show what's driving this is, is really no net loss housing and our, I kept referring to it as Rena, I apologize, the regional housing needs allocation um, and that we are required to meet these certain numbers um, during our eight year planning process. And um, that means building more units. Okay, I think those are my questions from this section. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Schwartz. Okay, um, let's see. Commissioner Campanella, you were next. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I appreciate the work of staff in trying to, the way they organize this, uh, especially, you know, the major areas of discussion, put, sorting the bills out by streamlining accountability and preserving. Uh, uh, I think uh, it, was, it, it was made clear to me a little bit that uh, in your presentation that a lot of the uh, bills that are coming down are not new laws. They're actually amendments to existing laws. So uh, SB 35 being an exception, uh, that, isn't, that uh, does create a new law, but also modify some existing laws as well by amendment. So uh, I think there's a public perception that a lot of new things have come down, and, but effectively, uh, I think we have to just realize that a lot of them are enhancements or definitions similar to what we do, amendments to our new zoning ordinance or our housing policies. But I think the way you put it together is really, really works out well, purposes, et cetera. Um, uh, you did my uh, the Housing Accountability Act. Some of the uh, the applicability, I think, affordable uh, previously was concentrated on a little bit more, as you you mentioned, relative to uh, what would constitute a change in uh, de in density. And uh, I think it needs to be clear now that market rate, as part of these amendments, also are afforded a lot of the same protections that uh, affordable would be. And the affordable as defined previously, I think was at 20% or 20% affordable, I think, yeah. uh, or 10%. That was 10. a percentage just like you would have with an inclusionary ordinance or something like that. You had different protections because you were pr producing below market housing. So you, you shouldn't have to produce the housing, but then be cut back on the size and scale of your, your building, which might undermine that. Okay, on uh, standards. Let's see, reason, got that. Objectives. Uh, see, on the uh, health and safety, if I can, you mentioned what could be health and safety, and I, th I think we need to be a little careful that if we do have outstanding questions on what was meant, uh, no criticism, but I think we have to be careful that we actually try to find out if there is a definition of the self and safety before assuming it's something, because I've heard members of the public come back later and say somebody said something at a meeting and they sort of use that a little bit as their own definition. So uh, as an example, we spoke about traffic. So if traffic could be health and safety, then I don't think the state would say there's unusual situations because traffic is always spoken about or parking is always spoken about. So I would just caution that if, uh, before we come up with something like that or assume, and it's tough because you're, you're being asked these questions, that we try to find out and get some clarity. Yeah, and Com Commissioner Campanella, I didn't mean to tie us to, to that one definition. In my mind, and I, I do plan on looking to see if the states, um, now that we have this new legislation and, and then with the 2018 legislation that where the state made that little comment about, you know, we, we find it kind of unlikely that there there will be. I, I do plan on looking. Yep. Um, the way nuisance often works is it's kind of you know it when you see it kind of thing, because it, it's hard to predict um, environment environmental impacts um, uh, that can cause a project to become uh, a health and safety issue. So. Right, that's, that's an excellent response. Okay, and I think that's real clear to the public. That's going to depend on the situation, not, not a, a given if this happens or that happens. Okay. Um, uh, deemed complete, when you're checking on that, uh, I don't know if this is a carryover from the Subdivision Map Act, but I think deemed complete is pretty, is it, is it more defined under actually 
subdivided property as part of the Subdivision Map Act, what deemed complete means, then perhaps when we start talking about rental projects or other things that we may be doing in the city. Uh, I, I would maybe just check, start there with that definition and then perhaps we can build on that. Okay. Uh, okay, big one in my mind is the, the lower density. Uh, I would like to assume, uh, pardon me, 13. Okay, uh, lower density, and then we, we spoke about units later on under the uh, no net loss. The lower density, uh, I'm going to assume, until somebody tells me different, that it's as broad and general that can occur in any project or any municipality who has certain rules or regulations that they're trying not to adhere to, okay? By coming up with a condition that could reduce the feasibility of the project, and it's not just units. Uh, I think when we go through our guidelines, we have to really look at some of the items that may affect a project's feasibility, at the same time making sure we're establishing the goals of the city relative to design. But I hear a lot about bedrooms, and you know, that looks like it's a, a bedroom to me is, uh, especially on rental projects, a bedroom has a resident, and if you have two bedrooms in a unit, they're sharing the rent. So we can't complain about the price of housing, yet force people to live in one bedroom units with less residents. So I think that does and may impact the feasibility of a project as an example. So I think we need to be general uh, on this. Uh, and, and I think if you, maybe if you speak to HCD or the legislative people, what was the intent of that change uh, to see and verify, maybe it's supposed to be more general and specific, meaning it's case by case, but not necessarily, well, you can do this to reduce the size of a project. Uh, we spoke about footprint and FAR. The, in my mind, the AUD project is an FAR project. Its density, its average square foot per unit, and its total amount of square footage that's allowed on a parcel based on your election. And these standards are set up in our zoning ordinance. There are objective standards, right, that are there. So I guess as we go through design guidelines, we have to look at if somebody's complying, either in that program or another program, if they're complying with the zoning, then uh, what type of situation can either try to reduce or uh, uh, deny the project. But I, I think uh, when we look at AUD, the whole idea there was to set it up on objective standards that if somebody was within that, they could be, uh, it was an incentive to move forward. So I think we have to watch that as well, not just units, but all aspects of what goes on the site. Okay, that's all I have uh, on that topic. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Campanella. Uh, Commissioner Higgins, you are next. Thank you, Madam Chair. So maybe you could explain <clears throat> a little bit about how the other departmental review items uh, pertain to the completeness determination. I think the, I'm guessing the completeness determination is related to planning standards, but there's a DART process where other departments get involved and, and, and I don't have too much familiarity with it, but is, is that gonna be part of a completeness review, a DART process or other departments I don't know that we, we've worked it out yet, but I imagine that it, because it's for multi-unit buildings and it's for completeness that it's, we're gonna, and we have such a short time frame that we're, we'll look to other departments if we need to. Um, right, because you can, you can be inconsistent with the city's codes or standards with respect to traffic or turning radius or trash enclosures or stormwater, roof gardens, you know, so what, what have you. So I, I imagine that's all part of DART. So I guess that yeah. the, the question, not really a question is, um, it's almost like an expedited DART review as well. Right. Okay. Yes. Thank you. 
Thank you, Commissioner Higgins. Commissioner Lodge. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Uh, to pursue a little further what Commissioner Schwartz was asking about the, the, the phrase of uh, was it, health, safety, and welfare, which I think goes back to 1915 uh, in the state's first law authorizing general plans. And that's over 100 years. Hasn't some sort of accepted definition of what that means come out through court cases as they, they've gone through or are you unaware of any such uh, interpretations? I don't think there's one specific interpretation. Um, I know from the city standpoint when we, we do nuisance actions, we're looking at various different case law to, to, to substantiate um, the particular health and safety aspect. So there's, I mean, this is as uh, telling Commissioner Campanella that's kind of sometimes when you know it when you see it, there's, it's hard to predict what the environmental impacts are that would cause health and safety. Um, I am hoping that um, the HCD gives us some guidance on what they're looking for and what they specifically consider that. But I think even if they haven't answered it, it's because it's, it's hard to predict sometimes. Okay. Perhaps that's a case of be careful what you wish for because they may set some <laughs> <laughs> some rules and regulations and interpretations that uh, are less than helpful as far as the city is concerned. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Lodge. Okay, um, I, I really appreciate the presentation. I know we're only on the Housing Accountability Act. But, um, you had mentioned, Ms. Ostringer, that um, the quote was two million, uh, there's two million unmet housing needs in this state. Do you, is that an HCD figure? Do you know? I'm just curious. I, I do, it's actually in the, the, the legislation. Oh, it is? <laughs> yes. So. Okay, okay, great. Um, okay, and then um, I also had a question about public health, but I think we've, we've done that. We've been over that enough. Um, let's see if I have any more questions is there a um, I mean obviously we have a lot of new legislation or amendments to legislation as Commissioner Campanella pointed out or whatever but it, it, do we have kind of a, a transition period to or is no uh, not no at transition all. period so, uh, that was in 2017 I think the, yeah, the bill okay. came in September and our transition period was about two months so, okay. so we we missed that. that that's kind of what I thought but I just wanted to make sure okay so basically what I've heard from a lot of the commissioners just to recap um, and correct me if I've missed something please or jump in if I have but the public health and safety that whole phrase is you know what we do with that is Maybe it's going to be on a case-by-case -case basis, but um, and the deemed complete. Uh, one of the commissioners said it's vexing, but uh, obviously it was vexing to more than one commissioner. So that's something. And I think uh, commissioner, what Commissioner Schwartz said about Rena is is um, very definitely should be more defined. And I've heard some other acronyms up here today, like DART, and there was another one that was used, but um, that we all know. But I think, you know, if we're going to, if it has something to do with the with DART, we need to define that to the public. So a, any of these acronyms need to be. Um, I agree. I don't even know what DART stands for. I just know <laughs> what it is. Development um, application <laughs> review team. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so it's it's basically kind of the entrance into the project, um, or it used to be, I guess. We'll see what happens now. And then I think the other thing was a reduction in density was, was another area. Um, we talked about it being assumed as broad in general, or is it more specific? So it's just something that, that needs to be looked at. And I don't know, did I miss anything that was major that people touched on here? Well, I mentioned slide 16. I don't know if the, this term deemed inconsistent. Oh, the okay. The word inconsistent yes, deemed and inconsistent. defining yeah. inconsistency. Okay, um, yeah. If that's something that's also uh, yeah. could be put on staff's list, I did mention yeah. that. Thank okay. you. Yeah, okay. Yeah, 
Thank you for that. Okay, so I think I think we've covered that, and I think we can move on to probably one of our all-time favorites, which is SB 35. So, um, and we'll start with Commissioner Higgins. So it's the slide SB 35 exclusions. And it's on page 10, top of page 10. That's slide uh, 27 and 28. And I generally was agreeing with your um, characterization of uh, Mr. Vincent's terminology about the unicorn factor until I got to the um, housing occupied by tenants within the last 10 years. So doesn't that remove any existing rental housing from the equation yes. in the city? Yes, and that's what I was saying. I think because these are infill projects, that's where it's going to really shrink where we can find them. I, I, I don't think that they're not out there. So it would have to be, um, so is it also, it's any tenants, it's not just, so if, if there were condos, I mean, it would have to be a condominium or a uh, otherwise occupied by the owner property, is that correct? Right, it's by for, tenants, I, I'm assuming for rental, rental yes, rentals. Yeah, so the intent is to not uh, remove um, very quickly displace those people that would otherwise be in rental housing now, right? Correct. So, okay, so, um, so the net effect of that is property that's not residential now, and with a pyramid zoning construct like we have for the most part, we're looking at this is applies to it's going to apply to commercial properties or other zone think, districts yeah. that yeah, don't have tenants right. where housing is allowed, right? Yes. Okay, so you don't think that's um, a unicorn factor as much as Mr. Vincent used to? What, what's your sense there? Give us a little I, I, I can see it. I don't want to point them out, but I, I can see places <laughs> that, I, that I can see where it would happen. Well, that was going to be my next question. Um, are you going to point them out with staff um, <laughs> Because you have a map, right? And, and the only layer not in that map, uh, from what I heard, was that layer that is, res uh, you know, uh, properties that have rental housing on them now or tenants, right? It, like an overlay? Are you saying remove yeah, well, the, the residential it, and look more towards the commercial? I, well, here's my, my question. So. Do you think part of the public outreach on this um, would be assisted by a map like that that actually shows where either there is no rental housing or those places where you have a, a sense that there might be. I mean, I know we can't put a map out there that's not definitive, but um, is that part of your thinking now on the spot, whether or not you'd put a map like that together as part of I think it. I think it would be useful um, for people. Madam Chair, members of the commission, um, we haven't gone that fine-grained on the mapping yet. It is something we could consider um, doing, but like I said, we kind of did the first brush map where we wanted to at least cut out the areas we knew Senate Bill 35 wouldn't apply. But yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm not. I mean, I think it would be helpful, but I'm not directing traffic, and that's another long-range planning project, right? So, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Higgins. Commissioner Lodge. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, it was a question that's been troubling me ever since RENA, Regional Housing Needs Assessment, which is a number that is, every county is assigned a number that they're supposed to produce over a period of time, and then as Santa Barbara County Association of Governments allocates those out, uh, and Santa Barbara has, by virtue of the pyramid zoning that we've been well, and it has been a case of as long as the community has zoning that provides the ability to provide for these, uh, then, you know, we're, we're okay. The community's okay. However, now it looks as if they're moving towards saying if you don't do it, you're going to get penalized. What is a community supposed to do if they're the housing authority doesn't have money anymore for this sort of thing for, for the low income and very low income. That's the only possible place where they're subsidized 
it, where it has to be subsidized, where you can possibly make, create very low and low income. Uh, the state took away the redevelopment agency, which was our, our and other cities' major source of funding for those projects. What's the city supposed to do? Build houses. <laughs> yeah, but, no, but I who's, think that, who's going to build them? Speaking to, to being penalized, as I think with regards to the SB 35 and the, we just have to show that we're being compliant, that we're, with the Housing Accountability Act, we're not reducing density and that we're, we're creating these objective standards um, that's go, that are going to allow um, projects to be built out to their zoning uh, capacity and criteria. I think, I, I don't think this, if we're moving forward in that direction, I don't think that the city or the HCD is going to find us inconsistent um, and penalize us as long as we're moving in the right direction. Okay, even even though there's no way, I mean, we've got what um, very low income, 23 percent low income, 17 percent. I'm sure that's all housing authority or other projects of subsidized uh, housing. Moderate income, 20 percent. That depends on developers coming forward and and building, proposing to build it. Okay. Keep my fingers crossed. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Lodge. Commissioner Campanella. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the 10 percent affordability is less than 80 percent, uh, 80 percent or below. Um, so so I'm, I'm looking at it, I uh, appreciate the comment of Commissioner Lodge, looking at how to get affordable housing built, you know, in line with the SB, SB 35 as an incentive to move through the system if you have 10% affordable or more. And uh, we are going to be looking at uh, a requirement for affordable, potentially, uh, which maybe would dovetail in with this SB 35, uh, it, you know, if it looks like there's an incentive or there are incentives that go with the affordable, I think we have to maybe start getting creative a little bit to show you can be streamlined, but this is what the expectation is. Uh, I believe uh, you could also do state density bonus and comply, you know, if, if you bring the income levels down a bit. So there's ways, I think, having worked with it myself, where you can take affordable and, and do a good percentage of it and at the same time help your overall project. Uh, one big thing would be certainty. You know, if I'm going in with X that I need and I'm giving you affordable some percentage, then if you give me this or if I'm entitled to something else, maybe I can make it work. Uh, and I think the prevailing wage part of it has, you know, probably been an obstacle for people. but on affordable housing, I mean, the housing authority is used to dealing with prevailing wage. They deal with it all the time. So uh, maybe there's some way that a, you know, market rate developer and the housing authority work together. There has to be some efficiency out here. And I think we, uh, as a city, we need to get creative working uh, with the housing authority who I think we have scheduled the lunch meeting or something for Robin co to come talk with us. Uh, how can we effectively get market rate developers to produce as much residential uh, affordable housing as we need and show them the benefits they can have in getting their project approved. Because I've been through that and I think we can maybe convince them with the right type of packaging and assuredness that their project would go forward, some amount of certainty. So I'm hopeful of that. I, I don't look at this as a insignificant capability or uh, that it may not happen because of all the constraints. I know it's, we haven't seen a lot of it statewide, but I think I'm, when people are watching it, I think there may be some coming through at this time where it's to the benefit of both the developer and the municipality. So I, I'm hopeful of that. Um, let's see, require a demo. I, I would ask, I don't know how to go about this, but I would ask the question of HCD on this. Uh, you can't, it, it you cannot require a demolition of housing occupied by tenants within the last 10 years. Now, I don't know if that applies to, if that thought comes from high-end condominiums, 
taking rentals out, and, and this was negotiated to the nth degree. Now, you know, they don't currently exist, but there's a single family house that's rented. Uh, but I think I would ask the question, how did that originate the last 10 years? Is it just because high-end condos would come in? Or what if the housing authority came in, took a site that was occupied by tenants within the last 10 years, but paid for relocation, produced more affordable housing that was there to begin with? Is there a way to get some type of waiver that because, is it, is it strict or could there be a waiver given for what you're producing on the site that was rented sometime during the past 10 years? So maybe we can inquire about that because that might be important. And maybe not limit as much the properties on your map. Uh, it may, you know, if we can see there's an exception, maybe you can open up, especially for housing authority projects. Uh, interestingly, I think your, the map, the uh, whatever page that was on, uh, 29 map. Slide 29. Uh, just by circumstance or happenstance, the areas that are shown that potentially you can do that, which I think we'd expect, where it might be allowed, is the same area as we have the AUD program. Downtown, east side, west side, to a degree, and upper State Street. So again, uh, maybe we can all get creative because we do have zoning and objective standards set up that perhaps in trying to achieve our numbers in all of the buckets, all of the buckets, not just above moderate, uh, that there's uh, enough out there that we could streamline, especially for the housing authority, to get those various buckets of affordability done within, or as many as we can get done practically uh, during the remainder of our uh, housing element period, the update period through 2022. And I think that's all I have on that one. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Campanella. Commissioner Schwartz. Thank you, Madam Chair. My first question in this section to staff is um, to help me understand what our legal requirements are during this period of time, well, during, between now and when it's anticipated that we would have new objective design standards adopted, which is winter of 2020, according to um, what I heard from staff, and I think, Ms. Deisty, what I see on our city's website right now under this, on this webpage. So we have this interim period. So if projects come in that fall under 35 in terms of our legal obligations, how are we to handle those? What, what, is it, what are our obligations with that? Um, Madam Chair and members of the commission, my understanding is uh, a project comes in, we would need to meet the timelines within the legislation mm -hmm. of evaluating that project against our existing objective standards. So we'd probably mostly go to the zoning ordinance and see does it meet you know, the height limits for the zone, the setbacks, um, density, whatever it is that's in the zoning ordinance. Mm -hmm. And honestly, if, if all our design standards or guidelines are subjective, we'd have to, right now we're going through the process of looking through our existing design guidelines and pulling out, maybe there's something in here that's objective. But most of it's subjective, as you probably know. Yes, right, so, that's why I'm asking this yeah, question. Yeah, we skip that process. Um, Under, we're obliged, if the project meets all the, um, you know, qualifications for exactly. a streamlined process. Yeah, I'd direct you to the Valco example. Mm -hmm. That was, that's The Valco Town Center, yeah, I'm that, familiar with that project. That's exactly mm -hmm. what happened, so. Mm -hmm. So, did, let me confirm, staff is already in the process prior to the subcommittee beginning to meet, already in the process of reviewing design criteria and separating out, if, just to use the terminology, separating out more subjective less or subjective versus stamp more standardized, concrete. Is that? Yeah, Madam yes? Chair and 
commission members. We're just starting that process, okay. but yes, sort of we some are. pre work to the subcommittee work. In Correct. A sense. We hope okay. when we start meeting with the subcommittee that we will have work that they can um, give us input on. Okay. So we don't want to go in with no prior research. Starting from scratch, yeah. so to speak. Correct. Excellent. And then how is staff or how would staff red flag projects that come in that actually do um, comply with uh, or would be subject to Senate Bill 35 uh, at this point in time? Who, who's doing that? Not who, I don't mean by name, of course, but how are we doing that screening so that it can really be raised up for staff to ensure that as it flows through during this interim period, mm -hmm. it's going to be handled properly subject to Senate Bill 35. So, um, Madam Chair and members of the commission, my understanding is, and this is based on the projects I've seen um, in other jurisdictions, the applicant actually requests, I want to be uh, evaluated under this Senate bill. So they have to actually okay. request that first. And then um, I saw two projects in Berkeley where it was actually the applicant who went through the city's all their standards and did a big long table of how they either complied or did not comply. So um, my understanding is they have to request this. It's not something we would automatically just say, oh, we're going to do the streamlined process. It has to come from the applicant. Well, that's a little curious to me. It seems to me the intent of the legislation as I've read it uh, is that the obligation is on the public agency, city or county, to apply the requirements of the law to projects as they come in to determine if we must follow a certain set of processes, not for applicants to be knowledgeable about the law and say, I qualify under, because that would, I think that would raise the bar very high for only the most sophisticated, experienced applicants to even know what this law is to have done the research. I mean, we're really looking at very different sets of applicants, and we have the full range of applicants, as we know, in our city. So I would think that's a little um, unfair is the lightest word I could use regarding that approach. So Ms. Ostringer, Ms. can Ms. correct, though. It, they do have to, the applicant uh, will come in and let us know that they want to take an alternate pr um, process than what we would do, and that's where we would, and they would have the understanding when they submitted their application of what the criteria was, so that when the application is submitted and it triggers that, that um, consistency check, and we, that we know and, and the applicant knows, because otherwise they could submit something and we wouldn't, they wouldn't know for consistency. It's a different process with different um, objective standards. Or could be. Well, that, um, yes, yeah. Ms. Deisty, will yeah, you Madam want Chair, to add, please? I just wanted to add to that that I've seen other cities um, do amendments to their zoning ordinance, and they make it clear in the language that there's two processes available. They can uh, go through and ask for the streamline approval or go through the city's regular process with the full design board review, mm -hmm. et cetera. So um, I think. Jurisdictions are really scrambling to figure out how to respond to this. It came up quickly. Like you said, there's no um, very little um, period when it didn't apply. And so at least what I've seen so far is they make it clear there's two sets of processes and it's up to the applicant to state which one. So are we more. going to put that, are we going to further, edu now I get to public outreach and education. I'm sorry, were you going to say something, um, Ms. DeBusk? No. So you're kind of leaning into the microphone. I didn't want to cut you off there. No? Okay. I was just going to say that it is somewhat um, similar to a density bonus project. We don't review a project and assume it's density bonus. They need to tell us they're applying for density bonus, mm -hmm. and then they tell us how they comply with the various standards of that mm -hmm. law. So it's similar that way because we don't know if they're doing prevailing wage unless they make that effort to tell us and you know request that process. Okay. So this leads me to public outreach and education. Uh, and maybe this is, um, if you'll indulge me, Madam Chair, more a comment than a question. As we plan for, I'm imagining, very robust public outreach and education, which will be critical as we move forward with implementation, I'm going to strongly recommend that we go above and beyond in our outreach and education. 
Commissioner Campanella touched on something that I want to further, and that is there are many benefits to a number of types of projects, whether we wanted the state laws to come through or not, that we now need to comply with and will advance housing production, especially rental housing production. Let's do our best to advise the public, to help the public understand you know, the what, why, and how, or at least what and how, both in our in-person in -person public outreach, but also on our city website, so that if the city is going to rely on uh, applicants to educate themselves and be knowledgeable about and bring forward uh, project applications that fall into some of these categories and take advantage of certain processes, we have helped the public understand what's available to them. And I think a proactive approach is um, the most important thing we can do. Uh, I think number one, even if we just, even if I were to come from the perspective that it helps us comply with the law, that alone is a reason to do more robust outreach and education. But way beyond that, it will help us help the community bring these projects forward and that, I think, was good for everybody. It will serve all of us. Um, so, Ms. Dicey, if I could just ask you then about if there are any thoughts ha staff have now about outreach and education. Is there, I'm going to go to, um, again, our city web page. Is there a, a general timeline that the community can expect on outreach and education as the subcommittee does its work? Uh, I did download this for Mark, but these are just kind of uh, general quarter by quarter, yeah. you know, what we're looking to accomplish. What so, can we tell um, the community? Yeah, Madam Chair, members of the commission. So um, one of, I'm working right now on a subcommittee meeting schedule and topics, but one of the first topics was actually going to be public outreach and talk to the subcommittee on their recommendations. Okay. I will say that we did put a notice in, um, the AIA, American Institute of Architects newsletter, and asked for participation of uh, anyone who wanted to assist us with this effort. And I did receive um, four architects that want to help us out. Excellent. So um, I did plan to go to the subcommittee and try to figure out when to fold in that effort. I also planned to work with um, the neighborhood advisory groups and um, you know, citizen planning association, people like that to get the word out. Um, another one of the first efforts we may start with, in other words, to get the word out um, even to applicants is, is a checklist for applicants. I've noticed a lot of jurisdictions, even if they haven't prepared objective design standards yet, they actually have a form that applicants can use. So if they want to, um, submit their project under the Senate Bill 35, the form is there ready for them. Mm. So that might be something we move forward with sooner rather than later. Excellent, okay. And then just to conclude in this section, and this is from slide 23, this is a stark representation with numbers about where we are, including the percentage, where we are in meeting our obligations to the state on our regional housing needs allocation. We have found through zoning and policies to have the capacity to support uh, uh, application approvals and construction of 4,099 units. Number permitted in our current uh, housing element period, 667. We are only at 16 percent. So back to my comments and my requests about accelerating the outreach, the education, the encouragement, robust, proactive encouragement. This is gonna help us move this needle. And I wanna say after watching Governor Newsom's State of the State address this week, he is all in on housing. If anybody thinks that the new governor and his staff and his close legislative, legislator allies are not gonna double down on housing. It's huge, and I'll get to another comment about watching State of the State regarding housing later in our discussion today, uh, but it was tame under Governor Jerry Brown compared to what we can expect in the next four years under Gavin Newsom. So I think we need to take it with laser-like seriousness, and I appreciate 
that um, Ms. Deisty and Ms. Ostring are on this, and I think as a team, this is gonna be excellent from the staff perspective, helping us um, move this forward. So thank you. In this section, those are my remaining questions and comments. Appreciate it. Thank you, Commissioner Schwartz. Okay, um, I think I had one. Um, oh, yeah, okay. I have one, one question, because I'm, I'm trying to understand. Um, okay, so eligible projects, um, greater than 10 units, you must use prevailing wage. Who actually monitors prevailing wage? Because I know on public projects, you know, we, we did monitor po um, prevailing wage, but uh, it, it, it's, a, it's great to say you're using it, but it's we the all know of, some people don't, yeah, even though they say they are. So. The Department of Industrial Relations monitors it. I, I know okay. uh, for public projects, I assume that because they're paying prevailing wage, then they would be registering with the, the D Department of Industrial Relations and uh, requesting the payrolls. Okay. Okay. And then on slide 28, we're back to the um, exclusions. Um, I'm, I'm trying to understand, and I'm having a hard time grasping the language, project cannot require demolition of. Is this a tenant's rights um, thing? Because, okay, I, let me give you an example. You have a very large lot with um, a smallish house and a couple tenants who've been there for a long time and the owner wants to implement and can meet all the conditions of SB 35 and wants to use SB 35 to demolish and rebuild. Is this a tenant's rights thing that he can't do that because the tenants are there or? Madam Chair and members of the commission, my understanding is, is that when um, the senator was considering this legislation, there was a lot of concern, right. particularly from the city of San Francisco, yes. about large... Displacing tenants, yeah. yes. So mm -hmm. I think that's where this got put in, in order to be able to sign the um, legislation. It was a deal worked out. That's that's my understanding, too. But I'm, I'm still, you know, I still wonder is if two tenants in, in a small house on a large lot have, have control over the owner by saying, no, you can't, you can't displace us and build that. Now, n normally a developer would say, you know, I'll displace you, but I'll reimburse you because obviously the, the, the economy of it might work out better, but i Yeah, Madam Chair, the legislation that's pretty much it's all it says, pretty, so it's, there's okay. yeah, it's no squishy. gray area, yeah. really. Okay, okay, great. Um, and I think, um, and I also heard one comment from the public a while back on, on the bus stops. You have to have two or more routes, buses every 15 minutes or less, and perhaps asking MTB to increase it to 16 minutes <laughs> in some areas, but, um, at any rate, um, okay. So what I'm hearing on this one, uh, we talked a lot about exclusions. Um, the mapping, uh, I know staff has better things to do, but there was some query about the mapping and, and you know further identifying specific areas where SB 35 perhaps could apply. Um, and then the, the process, um, Oh, the process during the time period when uh, between objective design standards and what exists now, and you had, Ms. Dicey, you had said, you know, perhaps we'll use a form like some of the other cities have a checklist or something like that until that gets resolved. And then um, a lot of discussion about outreach and education um, to advise the public of what's available to them. I think most developers will know, you know, what SB 35 is, but, you know, I think, again, um, uh, to Commissioner Schwartz's comments about Governor Newsom, we're, we're in a housing crisis and it's not going to go away and we need to, to do our fair share, particularly given the RENA numbers. So, um, okay. So I think, did you have something to add, Commissioner Campanella? I, I don't know if uh, you had it down there about uh, re reviewing housing occupied by tenants within the past 10 years to see if they're 
is some type of modification that could be granted if somebody like is the housing authority is providing affordable housing or even more affordable housing that may have been there before yeah well that's kind of where my question went to i i, I that's the, the, that's very confusing to me about about that and what you know are there processes whereby uh, tenant displacement can be mitigated chair wiscombe yeah. just one response to that is the statute says you can't demolish the rental housing so right. you could keep the unit or units and build around it if you want to use you know that sb35 or you can develop a project outside the sb35 process and just use the city standard density right. so it doesn't preclude okay. a project from happening no i under i understand that i understand that but i was just trying to this is specific to sb35 so as is prevailing wage so i was just trying to understand that so commissioner Schwartz, did you have something else to add well your questioning is is now making me reread re this this one phrase housing occupied by tenants within the past 10 years so to staff do you read this as the building has had tenants for 10 for the past 10 years or is this about a, a tenant's tenancy within the past 10 years is it so is it the latter or the former maybe you could help me with your your read your interpretation of this language so is it one tenant who's been there for 10 is it any tenants who've been in this building in well, any of the units for the past 10 years is it says yes? within 10 years so well, i think my, it's any I just would like my that. interpretation was any time yeah. within Ostringer, that 10 year period do you have anything else to add to that i interpreted it the same way as chair wiscombe did yeah. that it's any time within the, i think that's the way it's, it's as Ms. Dicey said it's, it's basically if there have been broadly. anybody renting there in this structure anywhere in the structure for the past 10 years within the past 10 years for any period of time right is that i mean i'm kind of taking it forward to just drill down is that yes so everybody's nodding that's their interpretation of this language yeah okay thank actually, you actually um chair wiscombe and um, members of the commission there is another caveat to this too where it does say the site um you can also not build on a site that was previously used for housing that was occupied by tenants that was demolished within 10 years before the development proponent submits an application under this section. So they really have strong tenant protections in this um, legislation. Good. That well, that that probably that just clarifies adds the frosting on the cake. Yeah. So. Um, okay, great. Thank you very much for that. Um, okay, so we're on to um, the last section, which is um, no net loss, SB 166. And also, I think at the same time, if you have any questions on enforcement, since we had a couple slides on that, um, or any other concluding remarks, we could discuss that. So uh, we'll start with Commissioner Jordan. Thank you, Madam Chair. So the RENA numbers that you're showing there, the 4,000, whatever, the 4,100 units, we, we have current, forgetting categories, not addressing the question of what category you have to fit those into, but we're currently zoned to have more building capacity than that, right? And 4,000 units? That's Sir, just, that's just our building that's requirement in this frame of reference, correct. right? So what is what is that number? How many zeros does it have after it? Uh, Commissioner Jordan, I don't know offhand. Is, is it a big number? <laughs> I don't know. I'd have to look at our housing element to okay. find that number. But there is a number somewhere. Okay. And so the task is to in that requirement is not to erode the big number that we don't know or the 4100 number within that time period in the no net loss it, so if it, i so if i whack away one and i, I take away a net loss <laughs> I, I take one away 
is my task to find one to get back to the 4100 or find one to get back to the big number that we don't know? It, it's by income level. No, I know it is. And I'm trying okay. to not get involved in those areas. But because it's still a big, it's still a total number. You've right. got a so, chart in. You've got a chart in there with a total number of 4100s. Yeah. You've got another chart in there that separates them out by category. But if you're just talking one category, then and if I erode a unit in that category, do I have to find one back in a time period of that category's allotment, or in the big number of that category's allotment? I, I believe it's intended to be within the the eight year cycle. Okay. I'm understanding, and to the 4,100. So take one away, put it somewhere else. So is this really an issue? I don't understand why this is really an issue then. If the difference between what we're zoned for in an eight year cycle is way less than what we're zoned for ever, um, and how would, how would we actually have a net loss? I think it's coming down to, and the way I was trying to frame it with, um, in conjunction with SB 35, is it's looking, it's looking to income levels, and these projects are are meeting low income, moderate income, and if they're coming in not meeting our housing <coughs> element um, requirements for a particularly zoned parcel, then we've right. got to find it somewhere else and make it up. Okay. Okay, I'm going to dwell on that one. Okay. Anyone else? Um, yes, Commissioner Campanella. Maybe following up on Mr. Jordan's point, uh, the reporting requirements now, what the heck is it? Uh, I think it's AB 879 uh, that uh, changes Government Code 6450, which is the reporting, correct? Uh, it's gotten more detail than it wants, then we put our housing element together on. Uh, namely, uh, tracking how are you going to produce each income level. And I don't think we did that in the housing element. I think we came up with 20 unit ac acre zoning and 30 per spot, 20, 20 or 30, depending on whether it's commercial or not, to come up with a number of units. And I don't know if it was six or seven, 8,000, I forget what it was. It was that range. But we didn't break it down by income. And so it was assumed that 20 or 30 units an acre can produce what you had, all of the categories that you had, or, uh, and the percentages that you see are, I believe it's the same for mi every municipality in the county, has the same percentage breakdown, not the same total number, but the same allocation, I believe. Correct. So we didn't look at incomes, but now uh, you're gonna be tracking uh, I don't know who looked at the webinar. There was a webinar on the 29th where they went through the new annual form, and you have to track it by all income levels, by whether it's deed restricted or not, your production, uh, whether it's ADU, whether it's taking advantage of SB 35. So they have all this details required, which we never planned for. You know, so it's going to be a little tricky going forward, I think, to, not tricky, but we're going to have to substantiate where we're getting it from to fill in all the buckets. So that's it's going to be a little more challenging than it was before, if, if, uh, I'm, unless I'm incorrect in discussing what's happening, this transition. Yeah, Madam Chair and members of the commission, um, yeah, the reporting requirements, the annual housing element reporting requirements are, have changed significantly, and staff has been. We've watched webinars, we've seen the forms. We're actually in the process right now gathering uh, the data, and um, it's all due to HCD by April 1st. So we've started that process, but you're correct in that um, there's way more accounting than there used to be. Um, we're tracking every, you know, even every single accessory dwelling unit will have its own line of tracking that. Well, by it's, it's, by, it's, by, it's by parcel. By parcel, correct. Every, all the activity yeah. by parcel. Yeah. yeah, so that's added workload to our division um, to do all that reporting beyond what we used to, but mm -hmm. it's now required. I think one, one thing amazed me too, if I got this right, you're going to be looking at, I may not have the terms right, you know, something that's approved, a, a, a parcel lot property was approved, so there's an approved category, there's an under, permitted under construction, and then there's a CO category. So there's like three different stages, all these categories, yeah. 
then you have three different stages. Correct, we need to track um, what it came in at, like how many units it proposed, and then the next year you track if where it is in the process, if it got building permits yet, and we also have to report if the units were diminished or you know through the process there's fewer units than were originally proposed and as a default if it's just approved for two reports in a row it has to come off the second report you don't bring it back in until it moves in the process i believe um i can't recall i'd have yeah, to look at the forms again a lot, yeah. a lot of th anyway it's different yes <laughs> it's a lot different than the report for the annual year 2017. It's this, online, thank you very much, but it's uh, a lot more. This data. is the quantitative analysis that Ms. Ostringer referred to, I think, in slide 37, maybe. Yeah, I, you talked about. Um, it's a little bit different. It's for that it, one is more project specific, more but housing they would look, I, yeah. I can imagine that uh, if we make those findings, those would be included. Okay, and then the alternate sites. And uh, I guess. Uh, we start looking at, we start doing a site analysis for the next update in about a year, or uh, do, do we have to start looking at the inventory again, how many units there are by, available by parcels that would, could produce uh, housing at various income levels? When does that process start? So, uh, Madam Chair and members of the commission, my understanding is the process starts again at the county level, at SB CAG level, um, Next year, I believe, is when it gets started, but then we'll need to, um, the numbers will trickle down from there to each jurisdiction, and then we'll have to start um, the whole housing element update process again. Much, so. Well, uh, let's see, if I recall, the 20 and 30 units an acre did not include overlay or priority over or anything like that, mm -hmm. and I don't think it considered merged parcels either, uh, where somebody might put two lots together and have more, a greater number of units, more efficiency. So there may be, uh, when we did it, I think there was some potential that if you, you didn't get some projects approved, there are other ways to handle it. Now it'd be interesting to see, you know, with uh, uh, this time around, substantiating by parcel what you could get in the way of what income level could afford that housing is gonna be real interesting, I guess. And. Uh, Okay, it's the units. Oh, it, w if I can, maybe just riff a little bit off topic, but you, you said that report is due April 1st, correct? Correct. Do we get, to, in the past, we've sort of seen it, uh, you know, as an addendum or after the fact. We, I, I don't know if we went through it in detail or not prior to like the semi-annual meetings. And given the nature of it, uh, not only the numbers, but also implementation action items, are we gonna get a chance to maybe review that so, um, Commissioner Campanella, I know that um, we have talked with my um, supervisor about how we're going to report these numbers to your commission, and so I think we're still thinking about, um, because like you said, it, before it was a addendum or an attachment to a big um, housing report that you got in your joint meetings, mm -hmm. and I think that approach has been changed, but um, so stay tuned, you'll hear soon about how we're gonna come back with the okay. Appreciate that. Um, Thank you. Update. Thank you, Commissioner Campanella. Commissioner Schwartz. Thank you. Um, so that I, I don't forget, I want to just, um, if I could add to the last comment, last discussion point that Commissioner Campanella raised, and that's our upcoming semi-annual work session with council. I know we don't have a date yet scheduled for that. Uh, but I want to impress upon staff my view, which is that I believe it's imperative that there be more interactive discussion on housing, on the legislation, the impacts, and our legal obligations. Um, I think it's been, uh, there have been moderate interactions among us and with staff in terms of substantial or substantive discussion. But I think we are now at a time, and I think everybody can tell from this hearing today and all the work that you and Ms. Ostringer have done, this is very serious for our city. Um, being prepared, educating the community, being in compliance. And you know, this is the body that does most, most of this work and does the research and reads. The council, the review boards, they are 
less engaged and less knowledgeable, but we're all going to have to, I think, come up to speed. So that's, that's my point about that. To this slide, slide 36, for everybody's consistent reference, could you just explain uh, in terms of average median income what these categories translate to? Very low, low, moderate, above, because as we can see from the statistics, um, not that we're doing great in any one category under the state law, but still between a high of 39%, which isn't high, down to 17%, um, and there's a lot of discussion about, quote, the missing middle, but these are generic terms, so I think it's important that we, number one, you explain to us today, and then I would recommend, Ms. Dicey, I don't know if you or Ms. Ostranger is going to make the presentation at our semi-annual work session, I think the AMI numbers need to be on this same slide so that each time this slide comes forward, we not only have the words and we have the stats, but everybody understands the average median income that relates to each one of these categories relative to our production performance. I didn't mean to put you on the spot, but, and if you don't have it kind of at your fingertips, and um, um, we do have a member of the public today who can probably. Commissioner Schwartz. Um, I, uh, uh, okay. Luckily, I brought the housing element with me. Oh, oh excellent. I didn't work okay. on the last housing element, but. Great, thank you. Okay, extreme, uh, sorry, extremely low. And this is slide 36. Well, if we can see this up there. Thank you. Go yeah. ahead, Ms. Dicey. Uh, well, they actually have extremely low, which is not um, which is not on, on our, the slide, but that's not obligated. Okay, uh, thirty percent of less of area median income. I'm sorry. Can you go slowly and sorry. tell us the AMI for each one of yeah. these line items? Extremely low, thirty percent or less of AMI area mm -hmm. median income. Very low is thirty-one to fifty fifty percent of AMI. Low is 51 to 80 percent of AMI. Moderate is 81 to 120 percent of AMI. And above moderate is over 120 percent of AMI. Okay. And uh, at the time, at least in 2014, the county median income was set a little over 73,000. So let's look at the moderate where we are at, no, I'm sorry. Let me make sure I've got these correctly here. I'm gonna go like this, wait a minute. I'm sorry, very low is 31 to 50. Low is 51 to 80. Um, moderate, yes, and then moderate is 81 to 120. So, and then above moderate, you, you yeah, you gave me there. Um, so this is interesting to look at the 51 to 80 because on slide 25, and this goes back to Senate Bill 35, on slide 25, eligible, on slide, yeah, slide 25, we heard from staff that the 10% affordability under Senate Bill 35 is less than 80% AMI. So, I hate to flip back and forth on paper, it's just a, a little bit awkward here. But then when we go back to the slide we were just looking at, and from the, the correlations you just gave us on AMI to categories, we can see where the project, where SB 35 projects would fall in terms of the income level. So as we move forward, planning, public outreach, education. I think all of this is important to fold into our, all of our discussions, semi-annual work session with the public. Um, even though this is dense policy wonk stuff, it all comes into play when we have legal obligations under the, the, the uh, amended and new state law. So that's why I'm bringing that up. Um, Let's see, so we're still in uh, no, no net loss. I think that's it because my other questions then are after that. Thank you, that's it for no net loss for me. Well, any, any questions on the um, um, next section to enforcement? enforcement? You wanna yeah. move right into yeah, enforcement? Yeah, we're just, okay. we're gonna try to wrap it up. Okay, yeah. very good. 
Uh, would you like me to do a wrap and do enforcement? I'm ready to do that. Uh, that would be fine. I, I do okay. have a question. Um, so I don't want to um, preclude any any other questions. That no, might I, be I have coming I have forward. a question on um, no net loss, but I can wait. So you go ahead. Okay. So on enforcement, I just wanted to hear more from Ms. Ostringer about the Huntington Beach lawsuit uh, from the state of California, and then what I understand is a counter lawsuit uh, from Huntington Beach back to the state on Senate Bill 35. Is there any? Um, beneficial information you have for us. I've been trying to follow it, but I don't. I don't have the time myself. So. Um, Madam Chair and, and Commissioner Schwartz, I actually um, did some research on this one because Tava was really busy getting ready for this presentation. So I can tell you what I learned. Some of which I can recommend. There's a, a podcast called Gimme Shelter, and they had an hour-long discussion just about. Huntington Beach and the can lawsuits. Can you send that to us? Send us the link for that yes, podcast. I can send that you would the be link. interesting. Okay. So, um, okay, so it's kind of complicated, but what it came down to is um, if you look at all the housing elements in, throughout the state, there's 51 cities that are not in compliance, mm -hmm. according to the state, with their um, documents. And some of it is because they're just late or there's a few things missing. But out of those 51 cities, there were three that are not, that were in compliance and then came out of compliance. And this is because they, um, rezoned or didn't do the zoning they were required to do to meet the numbers they were given by the state. So um, the three are Huntington Beach, Selma, and Clovis. And according to the article I found, um, Selma and Clovis are working in good faith to bring the zoning areas back into compliance, but Huntington Beach was singled out because they've been um, non-compliant. And there's a letter I actually found um, not that it's from November 2018 from HCD to Huntington Beach about their non-compliance. Um, so basically the development cap capacity for a couple of um, sp specific plan areas, um, they didn't rezone them in order to meet uh, their housing needs. Okay. And it sounds like um, this has been going on for a couple of years back and forth between the state and Huntington Beach. Um, I think Huntington Beach countersued and they're actually claiming that as a charter city Senate Bill 35 should not apply to them or any other charter city in the state so that lawsuit is still out there could if it rules in their favor it could change things for everyone mm -hmm. um, but that's my understanding of the case is that there's been okay. lawsuits and counter lawsuits and um, I think they're trying to get mediation and to work it out that's the latest I heard rather than have to go down this path. But yeah. um, if you look on Huntington Beach's website and Governor Newsom's website, there's statements about mm -hmm. this case mm -hmm. from both of them. Okay. Uh, and Governor Newsom mentioned this lawsuit in his state of the state earlier this week. I'm saying, you know, as a former mayor, he doesn't want to sue cities, but there are some cities that have, that the legislature and HCD believe are, have been defiant I think that's the term that's been being bandied about in Sacramento. Um, and so they're on the radar, and you know, Huntington Beach is one of them. Um, so I think, you know, in enforcement, um, that was really my only question there. I've already talked to you, uh, folded into my questions about the importance of public outreach, education. I've mentioned all those. I know they're on your list. I want to mention one thing, if I could. It actually goes back to slide 14 that I think we'll want to follow, and it's CEQA. I also heard Governor Newsom earlier this week talk about, uh, and there's a lot of interest in advancing legislation that will streamline CEQA on housing production, as it does for, I hope I got this right, stadium construction. Um, is everybody, is that on your radar? No. This, yes, yes, Ms. DeBusk is nodding. So well, there's already CEQA streamlining um, allowed for certain types of construction, uh, but not for housing. And uh, the governor welcomed new legislation as quickly as possible that would streamline CEQA for housing production. So I'm sure that will happen very quickly because there's a great interest, of course, in um, fostering additional new uh, rentals. So uh, I think we should probably look, look for that. Okay, closing remarks. First of all, I too want to thank staff. 
This is very comprehensive. I'm sure it took a lot, a lot of work. It's as my email exchange with Ms. Ostringer this week, it's almost a dizzying um, task to not only research, but then try to keep up with not only the legislation that, you know, in 2017, but also 2018, actually 2016, bring forward, including accessory dwelling unit legislation, which Senator Wachowski has brought back um, for ADU, what I'll call ADU 4.0, which he has introduced. So more to follow. Um, and uh, we've been asking for this housing legislation presentation for quite a few months. So I'm so appreciative of both of you uh, preparing and, and bringing it forward today. I really don't have any other comments. I folded in most of them. But I think if I could just in closing say, I think we're at a very different point in time as a city regarding housing than in my memory we've ever been where all of us as city decision makers, whether you're an appointee, you're an elected, we all have to elevate our education about the state's expectation, the legal expectations, and how we're going to participate in both the carrot and the stick. There are carrots to, I know that's, it may not seem at first blush that there'd be carrots, but there are carrots to being required to implement new procedures, new processes, to engage further with the community for feedback and to educate the community, and to do more than we've ever done before in balanced ways, but in more concrete ways, to encourage applications to come forward to actually get more, I'll say in particular, rental housing approved and constructed. So whether or not we are happy with the state laws and what's going on in Sacramento, there's a silver lining in the sense that if we do this right and we do it proactively and in good faith, I think this is going to be a win-win. I'm taking a very optimistic, positive attitude about all this, and I hope others are as well. And I'm very much looking forward this sounds a little corny, but I am looking forward to the semi-annual joint work session with council because I think it's going to be better than ever. And I am looking forward, as some council members have requested, for more interactive session. I think we need it now more than ever. Um, and again, in closing, my thanks to staff. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Schwartz. Um, did you have closing remarks? Okay. Can I just ask a question first, please? Or maybe two? Okay. Um, first of all, um, I'm on slide 39, um, identifying alternative density sites. So what uh, I'm asking if city approves a project with less than the designated density, what happens if the developer has less than the designated density? <laughs> <laughs> that's the point it's when the developer that's, comes in with the less than the designated um, units that are um, identified for that parcel in our housing element um, they come in we we can't just reject the project out of hand because it's going to mess up our, our arena numbers so they've given the the out that we go back and we we find another spot. You, so that's where you have to find another, one of the places where you have to find another spot if, if they do that. Okay. Right, we have 100, and only 180 days to do it. Right, okay, okay, that's what, that's what I thought. And then I was curious, um, I appreciated Ms. Dicey's comments about the, um, the Huntington Beach and the charter cities. Um, and I'm wondering, is there, uh, is there more written on that? Because I, I was curious, I seem to see smatterings about charter cities and Huntington Beach and something may not apply because we are a charter city and just like Santa Barbara is a charter city. So is there anything that you can specifically point to in your research that, that maybe kind of covered that or? Um, uh, I can't speak to the Huntington Beach one. I haven't looked at their argument as to why SB 35 uh, doesn't apply to charter cities. Uh, when there's a, a matter of local concern, which generally we've considered to be land use, the 
the state makes findings when they pass the legislation that it's a matter of statewide concern, um, in which case they say, and therefore it's going to apply to charter cities. And they've done that in the Housing Accountability Act uh, multiple times, and they've done it in SB 35. And then there's, uh, with Senate Bill um, 1333, that was passed in 2018, and they bit, basically did a broad brush for all the legislation that they had left out. I think they hadn't identified no net loss. So uh, there's a statement you'll find in just about all the, the housing bills that says this applies to charter cities. So they're, they're covering themselves too, yeah. Okay, great, thank you so much for that. Um, thank you for allowing me to ask my questions. You're up, Commissioner Higgins. Thank you, Madam Chair. So we're here, we all know why we're here, because of um, our collective inability to, you know, keep up with the times, I think. But here in Santa Barbara, we have a culture of, of not wanting to approve projects. And I don't mean that's the city within the city hall, it's just everywhere. So, but that culture now is, um, is, is a you know it's a philosophy or a culture that makes the application process extraordinarily rigorous and difficult and it and it turns applicants away they don't even want to take the risk and that risk um, you know was tied to environmental effects in the 70s and 80s and 90s and that was part of the um, part of the game I guess um, it seems like politically though that CEQA environmental risk has is off the table with respect to housing um, projects now. So what's left though is the philosophy and the culture of, of opposing projects or putting up obstacles to projects. And it's simply based on, we, we, we call it compatibility, other people call it, it's just nimbyism. And um, it, it takes different forms, um, <clears throat> even up here, with commissioners, some more than others, frankly, you know, it's hard not to tinker with projects, but there's also just not wanting to approve projects, period. And so that's a, that's a huge cultural phenomenon that's not going to be corrected in 180 days or 30 to 60 days. And, you know, now we have guns pointing at our head to approve these projects, but um, rather than talk about what you know, charter city applies, doesn't apply, mediation, that's all a bunch of crap. Um, what, what are we gonna do to improve the culture of, of the process, starting with city hall, that, that is somebody that's pushing a project through for an applicant? And, and that, that point of contact that might be either in the planning department or another department that is like, no, I got this. I'm gonna go over and make it happen with the other departments where there's a conflict. There's just so many overlapping rules and laws right now, and that's, that's part of the tangled web of why it's hard. But nobody, the culture, I, in my opinion, is nobody also wants to make a mistake in approving something that shouldn't be approved, perhaps because of the code that they're looking at. But the net effect of all of those codes put together is nothing gets approved. Okay, so it's a it's a it's a it's a mess, and that's what the legislation I think is getting at. With you got to do it in 30 to 60 days or whatever it is. But um, what what can we do to um, actually have the net effect of when an applicant comes into the counter, they go, "Wow, this is this is somebody's excited about my project behind the counter." You you know, is that part of the dialogue at all, or part of the are we, are we looking at it that way at all? You don't have to answer that, but, but I would love an answer. Um, uh, it, it's not a land use answer or a legal question, but it's a process question. And we've got lots of process up here on the, on the board and, and in between the lines of the legislation. So anybody want to take a swing at that? Um, <laughs> Commissioner Higgins, I think. I'm not gonna take a swing at that, but um, when we do work with the subcommittee, maybe we can work on process improvements and ways to publicize this as Commissioner Schwartz has been talking about, so at least people know it's available for them. Make the, you know, forms user-friendly, you know, whatever way we can make the process work for us, we'll try. Thank you. 
Thank you, Commissioner Higgins. Commissioner Jordan, you're next. It was not good body posture when that question was asked <laughs> over there. Uh, just one of my observation. Um, I, I agree with uh, Jay uh, on most of what he said, um, that the big letters I wrote down here in this process that same thing, guns being held to your head, you're being spelled out what to do. The key to me on this is to, to develop a, a system of customer service and processes that um, allows us to comply with what we're being told to do, but gets us to where we want to go also as a city, as a city here. I don't know what that is. I, I, I'm one of the guilty planning commissioners every week to mess up one of his projects. That, okay, we all are, are guilty of that. But um, it's not just rules and regulations. It's also differences in opinions and interpretations between like staff members or like reviewers in different parts of the same project. So it's not just the, the complex rules that nobody can get a hand on. It's person A having a different interpretation or opinion on the same thing as person B. And I think we need to do a better, a better spot about that, a job with that. I agree we're in a, just as Commissioner Schwartz said, we're in a different point in time. Um, I think uh, the goal of this should be to uh, comply with legislation while doing everything we can to educate the public and take out the uh, the uncertainties of uh, uh, the, the, the barriers of time and uncertainty. That continues always to be the number one issue of why projects don't get through is, is the, the costs associated with time and uncertainty. And I think we're seeing a backlash to that that we're going to be unable to get, a, get away from if we avoid it, but that we can somehow embrace the tensions and find a way to comply and not just annoy everybody. Um, so I think you're going to have seven people all wanting to be the two people on that committee. That's pretty much how I'm reading this up here, too. So good luck with that. But uh, I think we have to be proactive, helpful. Education should be a big part of this. Um, the, other, the other part of my brain says this is a path we're going down to that uh, um, that while solving, attempting to solve a housing crisis could also potentially uh, lead to either a livability crisis or an economic viability crisis, okay? The city's been built on tourism, built on the way it looks, built on the way it feels. Uh, we're, we're having a box put over us that applies to some of the biggest cities in the world and that are in California and told we get to comply the same way as those metropolises do too. And what will that do to us? We're all going to have to come back in our next lives and see how that all worked out, I imagine. But um, I hope that through that process that we don't just look at the, the words on the piece of paper, but we also look at internally what we can do to drive this in a direction that, comp that gets us in compliance, but also ends up with a result that is uh, decidedly Santa Barbara. So. I'll be one of those people fighting like crazy to get on that subcommittee, so we'll see you for that. We, we, did, we did that, um, yeah. I, I'd like yeah. to fight about it some more. <laughs> yeah, we did that, yes. Yeah, okay. Um, Commissioner Campanella. Uh, thank you, I, I uh, appreciate uh, comments from the fellow commissioners, including the last comments. Uh, I think uh, uh, certainty, uh, both by the public, uh, by the planners, uh, city council staff, and the applicants, I think is tantamount to successful community, uh, socially as well as economically, and still tr still maintaining what's good about Santa Barbara. Okay, that's the balance. We need to do the balancing act, and uh, look forward to the public input. I think having the objective standards, not just for SB 35 to streamline things through, but having that checklist, and not just for ADUs, but have that checklist of objective standards for all projects, uh, so that uh, we take some of the qualitative features out to a degree and say this is really what we expect. And if that's in our zoning, and we get that in our zoning, then those objective standards could be followed. We're not making modifications or exceptions. 
And if we don't like what's currently in the zoning, we change the zoning. So that means now you're complying with objective standards. So we're not hamstrung into doing things that we don't want to do. Uh, we just uh, are expected to help execute what we say we do want to do. So uh, I look forward to that balancing act as we go forward. Uh, I think it's critical now. Uh, if we want to revitalize State Street, which is a goal, we're morphing from commercial properties that were underutilized, so it made sense at the time, given the costs and market, to build something on it other than commercial. But now we're entering into an area of commercial properties that are currently operating. And to have uncertainty in the minds of the downtown property owners on what the rules are or how long the rules are going to last, are they subject to a test that's going to go away, may go away, or may be modified even further and further? I think the, lo the quicker we can get to a solution on what the rules are, by whatever way, and encourage them to come in, you're going to be, it's just going to be a dead zone relative to people wanting to get commercial property uh, revitalized or rehabbed or rebuilt uh, into residential that fits with downtown. And if you look around, you're going to see the wine bars, the breweries, office, office is getting redone, new windows, new balconies. People move on. And uh, I don't know what's going to happen between now and the end of the year when these ob objective guidelines come through. What does somebody expect to get when they go through design review? Are people going to be a little more objective? Is it going to be the same? Or, and we have this period where until the end of the year comes up, we're not applicants are not going to know what the rules are or how the rules are going to be interpreted relative to design review. So I don't have an answer to that. That's a question. Secondly, at some point in phase two, A, B, or C, whenever that gets done, the ability, uh, the project, discretionary project review for city council is coming to planning commission. And that, uh, I don't know if it's going to be on certain size projects or not, but you know, the AUDs will be coming to us for final approval. We need objective design guidelines. We're not designers, okay? So the quicker we can get those design guidelines set and established objectively, then we can do discretionary review, both on land use and on ticket, or the boxes all ticked off on design review. So I'm looking forward to that two ways, to help the applicants, well, a lot of ways, help the municipalities uh, the people to know what's coming, what the rules are, and also to help guide us in final decision making, which we'll be making on these projects going forward. So the more complete, intensive, and quicker that and public input we can get this done, the better. And so I'm looking forward to everybody pulling up their sleeves, working through and getting these objectives set so developers and property owners knew how, know how they can move forward, move forward to provide both market housing and affordable housing to the degree that makes economic sense to them in the community. So I thank you for all your work and look forward to moving forward uh, over the next year. Thank you, Commissioner Campanella. Um, I, I, I agree with all the comments, my fellow, and I realize you have your light on again, uh, Commissioner Schwartz, but um, I, I wanna thank you for the presentation and the thoughtful discussion. I hope, I hope we, as a commission of perhaps helped you. Um, I just wanted to expand on, on we, we've talked a lot about, um, Commissioner Higgins started it off about improving, um, uh, improve the culture of the process um, within the city. And, but I also think that, that there is, we need to improve the culture of understanding of our community, of the crisis we're in, the position that we're in based on your presentation today and the, and the new laws that we have and how we meet our housing needs and our arena, arena allocations and still keep Santa Barbara special, as Commissioner Jordan said. And I think that public outreach process is going to be, um, critical to the success of the city in, in many ways. Um, not only meeting our housing needs, but also um, keeping Santa Barbara special. So it's, it's going to be a big challenge. 
And I think it's important to let the public know what a big challenge it is and um, why it's coming forward, as, as Commissioner Schwartz said, because of the crisis that we're in. And, and Ms. Ostranger said, you know, we're two million units short in this state. That's, that's a whole lot of, um, of housing. So um, I hope we can do it, but I think the, the outreach component has is, is got to be a really careful piece that, that, um, that informs and educates the public um, to, to really what, what's, what we're facing. So, um, and Commissioner Schwartz, did you have something else that you I did, to, thank yeah. you. So um, Commissioner Higgins' comments just tempted me too much and I, I need to make some additional remarks. On a positive note, I think we have an unprecedented opportunity and I'm thinking of what occurred today in New York City with New York's mayor, Bill de Blasio, making a remarkable economic development decision, which this is why I want to remark this. There was, as you know, about the Amazon deal going into Long Island, and Amazon had asked for Unpresso, a business, a private sector enterprise, asked for unprecedented tax breaks without offering, in return, significant community benefits. I'm not making this up. This is what the entire um, city of New York um, mayor's office, economic development office, decided so. After soul searching, after looking at the actual economic benefits or detriments, they made a decision to deny or reject Amazon's offer to come to New York City. This has now been, it's nationwide news today. Why am I bringing this up relative to today? We have an opportunity, this is my optimistic uh, clarion call, for us to almost reintroduce ourselves from City Hall to the community. Yes, we value and appreciate the history of Santa Barbara, the values of Santa Barbara, but we are open for business. We almost need a banner outside City Hall saying we are open for business. And it doesn't matter how we got here, whether it's prompted by state legislation, we've done our internal soul search searching, but an era in a sense of what's already been described by some of my colleagues is behind us now. And we're gonna forge a new way forward internally and externally. And to me, that's full of opportunities, which is why I'm optimistic. But we have to take up the clarion call because if we don't, there will be more sticks than carrots. And I think there will be significant consequences for the city of Santa Barbara that come down from Sacramento. And we don't, we're better than that. We can do better than that. And I'm confident we can, so thank you, Madam Chair, for indulging me in my final, final comments. Do you, do you have the megaphone and... and <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm so charged up, I called Bill de Blasio's office to talk to his economic <laughs> development officer today. That was incredible. <laughs> okay, um, Commissioner Lodge. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'd like to remind everyone on the council that starting at least in the 1930s, the council has been, had bemoaned the housing crisis along with the water shortage. Uh, 1948, there was more bemoaning of the housing crisis, of the lack of affordable housing to rent or to buy. Uh, since then, or over the last 50 years, there have been over 25,000 dwelling units added to the city of Santa Barbara, and we're in the same position we were in before. Uh, as, long, as long as Santa Barbara remains a desirable place to live, and part of what has attracted companies like Sonos and Amazon coming in is what Santa Barbara is. It's not, uh, you know, they, they want to be here, and the development that occurred with the research and development companies during the 60s and 70s in the Goleta Valley was partly because of what this area offers. Uh, and I think, um, we're hemmed in between the mountains and the sea and with other jurisdictions on either side of us. So I just caution that we not act as if somehow this is going to be the answer 
to all the housing problems. It just isn't going to happen. Thank you, Commissioner Lodge. Okay, I think, um, thank you again for um, the presentation and all the questions and I saw you taking notes. We appreciate, um, appreciate the discussion. I thought it was a very thoughtful discussion. So thank you so much and we'll move on to um, item number four, which is our administrative agenda. Ms. Ostringer, I hope you feel better. Can I, do you mind if I'll just stay here since we're at the end of the thing or do you want me to return to my desk? No, okay. no, I think, I think you can, yeah. Thank you. You, you, can, you can wave your red flag from there okay. and say, no, you can't do that, no. <laughs> okay, item number four, administrative agenda. Uh, 4A is committee and liaison reports, staff hearing officer liaison report. Do we have, oh, is that, is that switched? Yeah. How, how did you know that no. had switched, but you didn't know that we had selected I two actually people for this? Looked at, <laughs> I actually looked at my 2019 liaison list yesterday, and the <laughs> subcommittee I'm confused about is not on that list, although other subcommittees are. So, I don't know. Can only say that. Um, nothing extraordinary yesterday at uh, Staff Hearing Officer other than a, um, well, from my frame of reference, a return of the uh, uh, medical marijuana dispensary uh, location on Milpa Street, which is still not open, and back before the staff hearing officer for a, a total revision of their operating operating and security agreement, and that was a couple hours, and and then again um, uh, forwarded to another meeting so answers could come back. So that that one apparently is. Uh, is still struggling through the process uh, to get through the process, but uh, it just, it's amazing to me it's, it's taking that long, and it's actually not taking that long because I watched that part of the hearing, and it's a, it's a, it's a struggle for the applicant to get through the process, I guess would be the polite way to say that, so, but um, nothing else to report. Okay, so stay tuned for the results of yeah. that from yeah, show. We'll okay. The <laughs> okay. <laughs> And then uh, number two, other committee and liaison reports. Commissioner Campanella, yes. Uh, no real project report, but just, uh, I don't think it was mentioned, but the other uh, members who volunteered or were selected for the uh, ad hoc committee on design guideline, ob objective design guidelines, were both chairs and both vice chairs of HLC and ABR. So we have a, Great. a very good experienced group you know, who know the process and are out there every day uh, in their own businesses. So I, I think it's a real good group to uh, get together. So do you two want to be chair and vice chair of this commission? <laughs> of, of that one? No, of this one. Why? No, I'm just... No, I, I don't get it. <laughs> no, I'm, okay, I'm, I'm just teasing you. Okay. I'm, it's uh, since it's chairs and vice chairs for the other members, I oh, thought oh, maybe oh. you two wanted to take oh, over the no, role no, here. No, no. And, uh, and I have a comment on the agenda. When we get, if I get time for that, the upcoming agenda, one comment? I think. Okay. okay. Uh, what, what do you mean, the upcoming agenda? Well, we're, we're slated on March 7th to go over the uh, inclusionary, and I was just that, yeah, but it hasn't been. A, oh, that's not finalized yet. Uh, we don't know uh, if that's the date. Mr. Bus can speak. Chair Wiscombe, the that. agenda has not been published. It won't be yeah, published uh, until yeah. the Thursday prior to the meeting. Okay, I don't, I don't yep. want to jump the gun. I guess just on the process, though, is given public outreach, et cetera. There's a report that's due from Keister Martin, et cetera. Do, do we feel, I just want to make sure I, we have adequate I don't think time. we're at liberty to discuss something that hasn't been published on an agenda yet, is that? I'm just talking about the time allowed I mean, for that particular item, whenever it's scheduled, to be cognizant of what timing might be required, time might be required. Commissioner Campanella, I think what you're getting at is that you would like to see that report more than one week in advance of the hearing? Yeah. Okay, I will see what I can do. Okay. Great, okay. Thank Good. you. Commissioner Schwartz. Well, not, well, speaking of housing, but not directly tied to a liaison role, I attended as I do, and, and when possible, uh, Commissioner Campanella attends also, the quarterly joint cities, counties, affordable housing task force. And one, one takeaway item from that meeting recently 
um, 3D printing of entire houses is now occurring outside the United States and the technology has been brought to the United States. Somebody gave a presentation on it. And so we will be following that and possibly being given an opportunity, at least by video, to see it in action, how a house is created through 3D printing and the remarkable reduction in cost to produce single family and multifamily rental housing through this technology that was created in Europe that is now being imported here. Hmm. So when it comes to try all the, the many ways uh, to reduce the cost of housing production, this is one of a number. So I'll let you know because if I can get a video to show uh, at one of our hearings, I will do that as soon as possible. Because I don't think we're going to be able to um, actually go to a site and watch it, watch it in production. But it's it's really revolutionary. When I think of 3D printing, I think of much smaller structures and not an entire residential structure. So uh, the revolution has arrived. Let me just say that. Thank you. Thank you for that. Okay, I don't see any more lights on, so happy Valentine's Day to everyone, and uh, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.